Hello again, folks, and we have a little impromptu, kind of hastily scheduled Ask Me Anything show, but I'm not on my own today, uh, which means I can relax a little bit. And um, if you were with me yesterday with Dr. Philip Blood's amazing show about the Luftwaffe in Poland, I'm still actually processing a lot of the information, the brilliant, insanely good information that came out of that. But today is a bit more informal. We're going to be talking about, well, primarily Canada in World War II, but you can throw any questions at us and we'll try and field them. If we don't know the answer, we'll we'll say no. But my guest, Brad, from On This Day in Canadian Military History is with us. And part of the reason for this is that we're all trying to help each other out. And I've got my little profile on YouTube and Brad is doing something that's complimentary, but slightly different at the same time. So the link is, I'll say it, well, I get it in the beginning, the link to Brad's channel is in the description below. If you're not following him on Twitter, if you're not a subscriber to his channel, then you absolutely should be. Yes, it's Canadian focused, but of course the Canadians were involved in every major theater of World War II. So you will be learning about all the factors, aspects of World War II. It's Canadian, but it's not just Canadian. So that's it. I've got the plug for Brad's channel down out of the way, but we'll do others as it goes on. So good afternoon, Brad. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on, Paul. And thanks for that uh, quick little plug at the beginning there. Really well, we, we're, we're all here to help each other and we're all different sized fish in different sized ponds. And, oh, yeah. and um, <laughs> the point is, we're all trying to get this information out there via this interesting and sometimes challenging format of YouTube. And oh, yeah. The do you put it behind a paywall? Do you do it free? How much stuff do you do? Do you do short stuff? Do you do long stuff? Do you have get there's and if I believe me, folks, if I knew the answers to these questions, I would be sitting in my gold lined mansion. But we, we do what we can do. But anyway, we've got some. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We've got some questions uh, and we'll kind of go through them. And so let us catch up with the ones we've got there before you bring some new ones in. And quite a, a few were up there about the age of what age you can be to join the Canadian military. And that was Mark Loop said that one up there as about, um, yeah, what age you can be. Well, we had a quick discussion, Brad and I, about that before we went live. And the, we don't think there are any rules. We, I mean, Brad, I'll let you kind of leap in and say, we, but there are obviously examples of underage people in, in various regiments, but as far as we can think, there are pre-war, there weren't any rules, but I'll let you expand on that. What do you reckon, Brad? Yeah, I don't think there's any official policy or rules or what have you um, regarding that. I mean, um, it's kind of hard to do in a show like this, but the, the pre-war Canadian militia, as it's called at the time, putting it nicely is a bit of a mess. Um, <laughs> the permanent force is very small, almost non-existent. So we have the militia, which is the non- we call them the non-permanent active militia. It's all very confusing, equivalent to the reserves today. Um, they kind of just, all these units do their own thing. So I know all kinds of stories of really, really young soldiers, like 14, 15, serving pre-war, um, and then um, getting kind of the boot once, you know, war's declared or they're found out, you know, found out. <laughs> yeah. They already kind of knew they were young, obviously, but then, you know, the official things go and families get upset. I mean, the first one that sticks out to me, I was talking to Paul, is George McDonnell, who fought in Hong Kong. He was in a unit for uh, before the war. Uh, he was going to save with them and serve with them uh, until his uncle kind of told them, like, he's only like 17. He can't serve. So, he basically, you know, hitchhiked his way out of town <laughs> so he could find a unit that would take him who didn't, nobody knew him. So, I mean, it's, there's no rules. There's no fast and hard rules about this until the war starts. Uh, and even then, as we were talking about before, uh, me and Paul, it's kind of people sneak through, right? It happens all yeah, the time. Yeah, I mean, because there's, there's official declared age and there's real age, which complicates matters. I mean, we, you know, we've got the Can young Canadian buried here in Brettville, so lays in Normandy, and there we, we were talking about, I forget my second name, but there was the American Calvin, some of the other who's in the U.S. Navy. They made a film about it with Ricky Schroeder, I think, played him. So he was 14 and served oh, in whatever right. battle it was. Yeah. Um, so there are definitely cases, but I think the fact that they – they get so much attention when they are when they are kind of aired is that they were reasonably rare i mean in combat in a war situation i mean we're not talking about things up in britain the territorial army of the 20s and 30s when you have boy soldiers and buglers and drummers and there's a strange kind of blurring of the lines between cadets and the ta because you might be a cadet but if you also play a, the drum you could go and attend the you know the the adult event, so to speak, but that's that's different. That's always gone. There's you know orphanages had programs of all sorts of things 
but this is this question I'm re relating is to in combat in World War II, and and it it, it, it it's a bit loose um, the the parameters basically. Yeah, it's 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 pretty rare, and I mean because I do the the Twitter account every day, right, where I cover different events, and I I like to do looking at individuals who who died in service. And I do that quite frequently for those who follow me. Um, but one, I've hardly found, you know, that was a young, young ages. Like I found one 16 year old who was killed in the RCAF. Um, he was a gunner, I believe. Um, but like that stands out. That's why I remember these things. Yeah. They stick out because they're not all that common. Yeah, they're young. I mean. But that doesn't mean there weren't others, but they had used yeah. elder brother's birth certificate or yeah. didn't even have a birth certificate because you know we're living in this time now where my phone i have my covid pass i can yeah. all my details are there this is an era when you know you kind of have your birth certificate is written on the back of an old cornflakes packet and your mum says yes he's 17 16 17 18 whatever it's a the, the rules were were looser then but it's yeah. something that would be interesting to investigate, but I don't know how you would easily corroborate <laughs> things because you'd get lots yeah. of family regiments because you hear it a lot People mm -hmm. say, "Oh, my granddad was only sixteen when he went yeah. in," and and you look up, and you think, "Well, no, he was he was eighteen when he went mm -hmm. in." It's the the family legend, and it's like we were talking again, and Mike Bechtel, whether his his ears will prick up, but we're going to talk about the twelfth SS <laughs> in Normandy, where books are still being published saying they were fourteen and fifteen, when in fact majority of them were eighteen and nineteen, and we and we we kind of know that, but yeah. these stories somehow persist of them being young, so it's. It's complicated that one. But. Yeah, it's a super complicated thing. Another thing I wanted to say is too is is again going back to the pre uh, pre war militia is the depression hit Canada hard, right? Like really, really hard. Like I have stories from my family, like they literally picked up and left, have to go because they were so poor. Um, but like that just offered an outlet, right? So and a lot of the militia units like the to have you know the pomp and circumstance and kind of fill the ranks, so they weren't asking a lot of questions. Uh, yeah, so um, we, we've kind of answered that one, probably not really giving <laughs> the detail people wanted, but yeah. that's because the detail probably isn't there. But a much easier question to ask, answer from Sheldrake6, and it's for me, but you can jump in as well, Brad, is if a client has time for one Canadian battlefield in Normandy beyond the Juno Beach, which one would you take them to and why? Um, as you're specifically saying one, I would say the Falaise Gap, but I would prefer to show them 0.67 and perhaps do totalized tractable and then get as far as Falaise. But I'll 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 stick to the rules of the question. You said one, so I would say the Falaise Gap. Um, what I get, what would you say, Brad? Uh, uh kind of not to copy you, but <laughs> like I would say right in Saint Lambert, though I would go right in because that when I went there, uh, yeah, obviously it's. A lot of Normandy kind of looks the same in the kind of Canadian British sector, but what really stuck to me is when I got to into the town itself. You know, the bridge is there and the creek or whatever it's the river or whatever it's called. Um, it is a river, but yeah, when Americans yeah. And look at it, they go, you, "You call that thing a river?" And he goes, yeah, yes, it's, "It's it's a creek, really." It's but creek. yeah, it's uh, and for those who don't know, what we're talking about we're talking about the Deev River, which is yeah. is the sort of north-south hurdle that, that, that was the uh, what the German army retreating from the Falaise pocket had to cross. And there you can go back and watch the Falaise Gap shows on my channel. I'm sure you've done some stuff about Falaise on your channel as well. And when people go there expecting to see this Rhine wall kind of river, right, and they go, but it's just a little creek. Yeah, but it's got <laughs> six foot high earth banks yeah. either side. You can't get tanks across nope. unless it's a bridge. But yeah, so that Falaise yeah. Gap, I think we agree on that one. I think because, yeah, it's like the perfect tank beer. But again, these are just my personal anecdotes because I was a bit younger back then and probably dumber. But I thought, hey, I could jump that. Luckily, I didn't try because <laughs> I don't think I would have made it. But yeah, you can, yeah it, you can You can. get the, the leap off, but maybe not make it to the side. Yeah, and, um... like, that's what I mean. Like, that's why it struck me because it's just like you read about this, you hear about this, you hear about the destruction, and then you go, this is a tiny. But once you think about it and see the ground, you're like, makes perfect sense. Which essentially is is, and we've said it before, is the benefit of visiting a battlefield exactly. live, or if you can't do that, at least watching a documentary or having live cameras there. Because so often, when you read about something and it's a black and white with black and white maps, you visualize a battlefield in a certain way, and you go there and think, well, that's this nearly really what not what I was expecting at all, or, or, or a film has perhaps influenced your. I remember the first time I went to, um, I think it was Stavelo 
So the Ardennes Battle of the Bulge, and I'd seen the, the crappy movie, of course, where the bridge, and you go there, and there's massive great gorges with huge great granite verticals, and you go, ah, oh, that's why that crossing point, this road comes down through the town, and there's a bridge there, and you go, there's there's literally no way of bypassing this, where from the movie, it's like, couldn't they just build a bailey just down there or something? So you... <laughs> Visiting a battlefield is is key, and 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 on that, well, we'll move on a bit because this I, I want to rattle through the questions quite quickly. So it looks like we're actually addressing what people are saying. So this is one for you, Brad, hmm. from Gary Miller. There, and it's how much of World War Two <laughs> is taught in Canadian schools, and what does it cover? And you have been to school more recently than some people, and indeed, you're still there in education and teaching, so you have a good a good um, understanding. I'm assuming. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean. Uh... Our schooling is called differently in Canada, right? So we have the elementary schools, which are up till you're 14, 13, and then high school, and then uh, post-secondary, and high school, se secondary school. Uh, elementary, it's been a while since I've been in elementary school. <laughs> I'm not uh, like a 20-something anymore. So I don't remember too, too much. I mean, particularly World War II was almost non-existent. Um, again, it was World War II TV, but when you're talking about Canada, it's World War II. Um, First World War is unavoidable. Uh, that's huge. Like that's talked about nonstop because Remembrance Day is the commemoration day for us, right? So the First World War gets a lot of the attention. So once that's finished, and they don't really talk about it. High school a little bit because you you have to take, well, in Ontario anyway, you have to take Canadian history. Um, that's one required course to get the diploma. So it's talked about a little bit, but hardly at all. I mean, it's Juno Beach. I think that was it. Uh, if that was like one part of a lecture in one day uh, and then university it's depends where you go who the faculty is um, all that kind of stuff so it's not really a blanket answer per se because again if you're going to back through it the the provinces all have different curriculum it's not nationwide by any means so again I'm not a, a elementary school teacher secondary school teacher but uh, I know some people who are and it's there's not that much uh, unfortunately, and should there be more, of course, I'm going to say that, but I think it's important because we are so first world war focused in Canada still after the centenary is over. And, and I think that's going to last a while. And the second world war stuff kind of kind of takes a back seat, which is unfortunate because it has such a huge impact on Canada today. I mean, it, massive. Oh. It's probably not how much you've, um, you're taught it's how well you're taught as well and, yeah. and and what you take away from it in that you don't necessarily have to be at hours and hours of study for it to make a difference and you find out this is something i want to do and and you could and conversely you could be taught for months and months yeah. by a boring teacher and it just actually take away any interest you had going into it so you know it, it, it's how it's taught i would still think and it's not what people ask but i would still think the majority of historians who are talking about World War II, writing about it, are actually their their main thrust of their interest came from something outside of education. It came from meeting veterans. It came from war films. It came from comics. It came from that side of it. I would suggest that still, when people are honest with themselves, they would yeah. say that's the kind of experience that actually got them interested more than mainstream education, which is not a very complimentary <laughs> towards mainstream education um, it's not i mean it's it's unfortunate but you're i think you're right i mean for me it's the exact same thing i mean mine came through my grandfather who was a vet not a combat vet but a vet uh and he loved history just anyways so he was always reading something so that's kind of where it came for me like this family connection and hearing about all this stuff um, from him because he, he liked to tell uh he was a storyteller some of them were some pretty tall tales of his service his brief service but uh, still enough to get me interested so yeah i think you're, you're right it's this other things, it's not necessarily the schools. And I think things like YouTube and all the new social media is going to be that for the new generation, I'm hoping. Well, here's, here's hoping to that. Yeah, he's yeah. hoping that when people have an interest, that there will be a means of them developing it easier than perhaps when I, you know, when I was younger. I mean, I I, I think it was probably Cornelius Ryan's book, The Longest mm -hmm. Day and The Bridge Too Far, that had in the, the kind of the, the appendices, it had the list of interviews, and it would say, Fred Smith, whatever, Manitoba or something. And yeah. I would literally go to the library, uh, 
request copies of white pages and books and then go <laughs> back the next week and they were there and i would try and find it actually wouldn't work i would never look up people like fred smith because smith but i would look up for some weird name yeah. you think oh, hopefully there's only one of them in that town <laughs> and i would write to veterans and I, you know i said how much i spent on postage back when i was 17 18 but i would write these american veterans and british, i mean british veterans i was meeting anyway right um to get more information and write to historians as well. And, and, and now, you know, with the click of a button cliche, but yeah, you know, that it's, it's amazing. Just today people can suggest to me on Twitter, you should contact this historian. I go find the historian's website, do an email and there's a reply back in an hour saying yes or no, I'm too busy or, and that's incredible that we can have that, com that, that contact now that, that wasn't possible. So, yeah, I mean, I'm not, like I said, I'm not, you know, 20 something. So I remember I grew up, um, without the internet really didn't come until I was a bit older. I mean, for me, the big thing, and I think you've talked about this with other people and other streams and all this kind of stuff of like, what's that big event? I'm from the generation where it's, it's Saving Private Ryan. Uh, yeah. Because that came out when I was about 10 or 11 years old. Uh, so obviously my parents uh, wouldn't let me watch it because, uh, yeah, <laughs> for reasons. But, you know, it still was really interesting to me. And, and then the Band of Brothers thing really cemented it. So for, I think, people my age, it's this... Uh, the, the the media, the movies, this miniseries, all that stuff kind of cemented it. So so mm. to me, it's a little bit different, right? Because a lot of the veterans, they were still around when I was young, but they were quite elderly, a lot of them, right? So, and didn't get to meet as much. And then every year there was less and less, which is unfortunate as we're now facing now. But it, we used to have like vets would come into school like around Remembrance Day, talk about, you know, briefly about their service kind of thing. So we had a bit of that too, but it wasn't quite the same as I'm sure it was for you and people older than you. Yeah, I mean, it's I, I'm a, from the age of kind of bridging both generations, the kind of the going to libraries, writing letters, and also the, the internet as well, you know. So uh, yeah. I, I'm kind of bridging those. But we'll keep on moving. Um, and this is from Kevin Jones. What action or action did the first Canadian parachute battalion uh, take part in after Normandy? Were they involved in Market Garden, the Ardennes, and the crossing of the Rhine? They weren't involved in Market Garden, but they were involved in the Ardennes. I can't remember the crossing the Rhine. Yeah, yep. they were. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the Ardennes, they're they're of course they were. Yeah, yeah, they're tangentially involved. Uh, they come and fill part of the line very late in the Ardennes offensive. I think after pretty much it had almost petered out completely, because uh, I did a little uh, dig on them quite uh, about a year ago now. I can't remember exactly. Uh, and there's hardly anything in the war diary. Uh, nothing really happens. I mean, there's a few contact patrols from what I can remember, um, but that's about it. Uh, and then they're involved in, in an Operation Varsity uh, crossing the Rhine, which is their big one, right? Other than yeah, Norman, yeah, it's yeah. Like Varsity. And there's a VC one there by, uh, by an air medic. Uh, it's not very well known in Canada, even I'd say remotely at all, unfortunately, because um, the crossing the Rhine is hardly known here. Um, but uh, it, it's it's their, their big one. Uh, and then they move through... Um, which is uncommon for the Canadians, right? Because they move through the Netherlands and Belgium and into parts of Northern Germany. Uh, but they go all the way to the Danish border, right? And they actually meet Soviet soldiers. Like there's photos of, of them shaking hands, like you see. And actually <laughs> read an account from the war diary that basically saying on VE day, like the Russians had a lot of vodka and I don't really remember the rest of the day. So that's the <laughs> Honest, <laughs> nothing else. Yeah. So they kind of, stuck out for me um kind of that sort of because that's a different experience right because you don't get that with the with yeah the and and it's it, the, the one of the, the crosses that the troop the airborne troops were involved on d-day have to bear yeah. is that everyone only remembers where you june the 6th and june the 7th and and one of the things i'm always bang on about and this is not going back to sheldrake's questions about which battlefield would i visit to but he said one is talking about the two and a half to three month long sitting on that ridge that the British Sixth Airborne Division and the commandos did, and elements yep. of other British for, for, that everyone kind of overlooks. We yep. we we get really excited by the the gliders landing at Pegasus Bridge, the the Merville Battery, and yep. some of the fighting in Ronville gets talked about a little bit. But the sitting on that ridge for three months while everything else happened around it gets so overlooked and. It's not that day to day the Canadian Parachute Battalion were necessarily involved in the most pivotal actions that were changing the outcome and shape of the battle normally because they no. they weren't. No, but they were sitting there along with the Sixth Airborne Division holding that flank. They weren't trying to move out. The Germans weren't really trying to knock them off after a few weeks, but they were just there aggressively patrolling, shelling the shit out of each other every day. If you go up there, you can still see the the, the, the damage to trees, things like that. And, you know, yeah. as, as Brigadier Hill said, who's 
whose brigade, of course, includes the first Canadian parachute. Now, I think he says, I took in 3,000 men and went out with, totally, I took in 2,600 men and went out with 400 at the most or something. Yeah, something he's, like that. Something like that. Is I forget the exact the figures, but the point is, he's saying that over those three months, it was just, sustained casualties day yeah. in day out and there's that photo isn't there that of that canadian para and i think it's about three or four days after june the 6th mm. and he's going to sit in and he just looks like he's just you know what's it all he's got that same look you see on the faces of the guys in verdun or yeah. those rare photos you have the american civil war after a big long campaign he's got that thousand yard stare of what are we all here for? And, and I always make, well, I'll let you jump in in a minute. I always make that point is when the sixth airborne division are sitting there, it's not like anybody like Dempsey or Monty is coming up to Eisenhower saying, look, what you're doing here, lads, is really important. And I think the veterans, are, and Paul Reed is watching, who's met more veterans than the two of us put together, because Paul Reed is the a legend, is that, you know, you can understand when you talk to veterans the loss of a friend if they feel that when they lost their friend they gained that town look look we've covered two miles yeah. today we started back here now yeah. we're here and yes we lost joe on the way here but look there's those french civilians now who are giving a side we've liberated their town that that somehow offsets a little bit the loss of the friend right but when you're sitting as a sixth airborne division be basically in the same wood for three months it's hard to then um deal with the loss of your friend to a shelling uh and you think well what, what what's what's it all for um yeah i mean i think i think you're right like that's that's part of the canadian narrative of normandy overall right i mean I, I, like i don't know putting numbers on it but most of the attention is on you know, yeah that story is, is a is a good one because uh I heard that on that spot. So that was, <laughs> it was particularly interesting. <laughs> they were trying to get rid of the smell from what I remember and it made it worse, which is not unsurprising, but they were young men. So young people do crazy things, but uh, yeah, sorry. It's that idea of the, the attrition, right. Of sitting yeah. the yeah, Germans yeah. are, you know, over there, we're here, we're trying to push forward and they do eventually keep pushing forward. Right. There is, like you said, that narrative of literally moving forward with all the different operations. I mean, I'm sure someone might ask about those later and all the controversies, but uh, for, yeah, for the airborne, they don't have that. And I mean, they're lost in the narrative completely because uh, they only are a battalion, right? They're not hardly any of them as it is, you know, overall speaking, we have whole divisions there and then first Canadian army gets activated. Uh, it's, it's just lost in the story. I mean, there was a little bit of stuff when Band of Brothers came out that there was document, there was a documentary interviewing them, the same sort of style. Uh, but I don't think it got any sort of traction, unfortunately, but the stories are, are, they're mind blowing. Yeah. I mean, just the, which, which, which brings us up to the, this whole thing about telling the same stories again and again and again. And, and there's been a couple of people saying there that well, Kevin Jones said Operation Varsity isn't covered, and it isn't. I mean, we I did the show with no. James Fennell on about which was an overview about the 17th Airborne's role in it. But as far as everybody else is concerned, it's it's yeah. lesser talked about. But the thing is, and and this is the chicken and egg aspect of it, is historians and authors have to earn a living, and and if, yeah. you know that if you do a book on Vimy Ridge or Dieppe or D-Day, there's a bigger audience there for it than if you do Operation Varsity or Canadians in the Battle of the, of the Bulge. Even though there's a there's a small group of people who go, oh, brilliant, a story, mm -hmm. a book about the Canadians in the Battle of the Bulge. But and that small view, small buyer readership would be very grateful for that book appearing. But a small readership doesn't unfortunately put meat on the table that's, no, that's the issue isn't it so another book yeah. that covers the canadians on juno beach or the british at pegasus bridge will will unfortunately kind of well not unfo it's, it's good that they will sell but it means it's at the expense of people writing about the more obscure stuff um, yeah and you're right especially in the canadian case right like and i'm not saying that the, some of the stuff on norman say normandy is not innovative new like i mean mark milner's book who you had on the channel is a brand new way of looking at this. I mean, that mm. was kind of like a mind blow when I read that. It, make, it makes perfect sense. Uh, but anyway, like it's just, you can have that, but in particular in the Canadian case, again, we're, there's not that many of us. So we don't, in our trying, I'm trying, but uh, Linda, a lot of us are trying, but it doesn't really have, a, you know, an international audience, unfortunately, for Canadian stories. Even though I think some of these would be, and I'm not the only one, if they were Americans or Brits, sorry, no offense, but these would be Hollywood movies. Like the things yeah, no, true, have. yeah. I mean, it, it, like it, 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 you'd think they're fake. <laughs> you know, you hear them, you're like, no. 
So, I mean, it gets lost a little bit, and then we do the grand narratives. And, I mean, that's partly our own fault. But, uh, yeah, you're right. Like, I just – And this is why, without patting ourselves on the back, although I think we can <laughs> pat ourselves on the back, is that what we're doing with the YouTube medium is you can give a day and a show to mm -hmm. an obscure subject – you know, okay, you're, we're not doing the, the boots on the ground. I mean, it's my historian guests come on and have done that. They've done the work, you know, fit it, fit it blood last night, 15 years of blood, sweat and tears. And <laughs> I've got to prep for a, a day to get the show done. It's mm -hmm. uh, He's made the effort. I haven't. But then I can move on as I will be tomorrow night to Arnhem again. So I, I can do that. But if you're, if you're a working historian, you're, do, you're, you're, you're spending that time going to archives and looking at the, 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 the archival material and the, you know, you've got to consider, will this book sell when I finish it? Unless you're the amateur historian, people like, I don't know, Greg Way, for example, who has a day job and he wrote about the Fauci maker. That, that's inter that's def different. Right. But if you're trying to make a, a living out of this, it, it, you, you, balancing that, will this sell, will people read it, uh, with the, I'd really like to do this because that interests me, is... Is a is a tough tough act. On that on that subject, Brad, I just asked because we had a question a minute ago. Yeah. Um. Uh, from Scott there saying to Brad, you use a lot of original film and photos in your content. <laughs> Where do you find the primary source visual content of your videos? Looks like a lot from the Canadian Army newsreels, which I think he's kind of answered his own question. Yeah, answered his own question there. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously it is. I mean, I used to cut that part out, but I think it's more interesting to keep that part in. Um, I have one coming. I, I was working on it just before jumping on here uh, in between reading. Uh. I, I think it's interesting because it, it shows these trends that I'll say are more like academic in a sense, like things that don't get talked about too, too much, but I think they bring out different stuff. So that's kind of, sorry, there's a bit of a tangent, but that's kind of what I'm doing with that. But yeah, it's the Canadian Army newsreels because they're available. I mean, uh, no offense to anyone out there, but our digitization, our archives are not good at getting this stuff out there. So it's a slight well, Better than Britain, I would I would venture to say. No, America, <laughs> USA is leading the way. The National oh, yeah. Archives, the public domain um, are leading the way in this regard. Well, um, like, Canada yeah. and Australia, I think, are in maybe the second league. And Britain, yeah. alas, is is way down the bottom, I would say, in how in the and the accessibility and the freedom of use and you know don't don't get me started on that i'm not yeah, I mean, naming yeah, organizations yeah. but you know yeah you guys well in britain sorry they have their interesting things going on anyway i don't want to get into that because i've had to deal with that myself a little bit but uh yeah we do but we're just there's just not that much i mean I, that american archive like the american national archive has tons of canadian stuff yeah like that's where i find some of it too like i have to dig it's highly barely highlighted and sometimes you just got to go through it uh, so that takes some time like that. Like these videos are not, they're short and then that's the idea, but they're, they're not, they take some time to put together and make them make sense. Uh, so that's kind of why I'm looking for this. Well, and, and that is where I'm going to yeah. pay tribute to you because there are lots of little content providers that shove up these bits of public domain footage with their, if they're a digital provider, they put their logo over it. And we all, we all yeah. use that for studying it, but usually there's little contextual information about what you're actually seeing there. They, they've simply transferred what it says on the original reel, which may or may not be what is what you're actually seeing. Yeah, exactly. And, and, I mean, and what you're doing is you're taking the footage and say, okay, what have we actually got here? That clearly, that bit of footage there clearly wasn't taken in that battle there. They've put yeah. that in to put that. And you've, you've cut, you know, the, as I know in the, editing hell of, you know, you start with a five minute clip. I'll just, I'll just make that and 15 hours later. Yep. <laughs> You've got your four minute segment out of it. Yeah, exactly. It's, but, it's, you know. it's not easy, but uh, yeah, there's stuff out there. There's lots of hidden gems, but I just, I keep digging and trying to find them. And I mean, there's again, like, yeah, I know we're a bit lucky here, but there's other archives. I just get jealous. Like even in the Netherlands, like they've consolidated a good chunk of their military history archives. I couldn't, yeah. I wasn't really looking for uh, film content at the time. I was looking for photos, which I've used since in a couple of capacities, but it's, it's amazing of what's out there. So it just kind of makes me a little jealous, but uh, yeah, sorry. But, but yeah, definitely uh, the Canadian news reels. I'm trying to find other sources, anything I can dig, but the U S has some good stuff on Canada as well. Cause there's a lot of, and I wanted to say this before I forgot, but uh, there's a lot of cooperation between American and Canadian forces throughout the war. I mean, you have Kiska, yeah. which was supposed to be a battle. Yeah. yeah, I, mean, yeah, I, yeah. I did one on that and I put, you know, battle in quotation marks because there's no actual fighting with the Japanese because they're gone. But there's a lot of that going on, and it's I think not as well known, uh, unfortunately. 
Yeah, and which which brings us back to this this thing that we can bring the un, slightly unknown stories to people a little bit better than than an author can. But um, and moving on from archives slightly, Scott Grimwood um is there an accurate and accessible timeline of Canadian military activity? I would suggest the Project Forty Four website is is a really good starting point. I haven't put the link in below, but now I know you've asked that. I'll try and remember to do that later on. But look up Project Forty Four dot Canada, and it's um. Well, yeah, interactive maps, la yep. layers, um, clicking on things with footage coming up and stuff. And it's it's predominantly Canadian, but of course they're now expanding it to include Britain and uh, and the USA and stuff as well. And again, yep. it's 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 really not amateurs because they're professionals of what they do, but it's it's a yep. labor of love rather than a a, a financially gaining yeah. um, project. Um, well, it's 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 a nonprofit from Canada, so it's it's not even for. Probably. Yeah, it's not even trying to do that, but yeah, yeah so this is what they're just trying to get other. Well, because in full disclosure, I've done some work for them, and I will be in the future a little bit. Um, and I've done some of the, I haven't done the mapping stuff because I'm I'm hopeless with that, but I enjoy the maps. But <laughs> uh, but yeah, they've they, they've really um, uh, started to do some good stuff um, and talking to them all the time, and it, it's really good. Yeah, it's 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 moving along. There's uh, non-Canadian stuff there as well. I mean, I think uh, they did. Yeah, they did Iwo Jima. Uh, they they did. Yeah, that was good. They did. That was very good. Yeah. Yeah, that one was impressive. I mean, very, very impressive. But anyway, yeah, there's like, it uses yeah. Google Earth, it uses satellite imagery, it uses yeah. the, the wartime maps with contour lines. And yeah, yeah, I used yeah. I used their Iwo Jima um part from, from my Iwo Jima week, and there's some good stuff there. And yeah. just kind of jumping in there because it's it's a valid point. And and uh, Paul Reed saying, of course, his British audiences right. do enjoy Canadian stories. And that this this is this is that interesting dilemma that tour guides and historians have mm -hmm. is that if you once you get people to the obscure place or the obscure subject you i've never had someone saying well this is boring paul if i've managed yeah. to convince an american british canadian whatever to go to a place that i think is worth going to and they mm -hmm. had never heard of it i've never had a case of saying i frankly paul i wish you'd take me to a museum this is shit they, they always appreciate it the, the the hurdle is getting them to take on board the concept of a place that they haven't heard of that's the yeah. that's the that's the big thing and, and you must have that same thing you know you know that if you put diep in a title of a video it'll have a it'll flip it'll trigger lights yeah. that perhaps <laughs> hong kong wouldn't or or something and, and but how we can move to that stage where people will it's like trying new things on menus isn't it really we all go there go, yeah. oh they do this and then they come and they say and have a burger, please. We, yeah. we, we, we all are a bit yeah. um, unbrave in our choices. Yeah, and I, I think that's uh, that's what I was going to say. I, uh, it's a hurdle. You got to. It's that first step. I, Paul is right. I mean, uh, I agree. I mean, once you get there or to that spot or what had the memorial or what have you, uh, people are going to. Yeah, they're not going to say this is boring. I don't care. <laughs> like they're going to get engaged with the story. It's just how do you do that, and then how do you do that digitally is a whole other ball game. I mean, yeah, like you said, if you put in D app, it's going to trigger that Canadian. I don't know I call it a, literally like a scar on the national psyche. Like you just, mm -hmm. it is. It's like lights go off. Uh, but if yeah, if you say Hong Kong, they're like, oh yeah, that went bad. I think, you know what I mean? It's 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 hard. And then again, we're Canadians. I'm going to freely say this: we have a big chip on our shoulder about pretty much everything. And we always think like no one's paying attention to us. Nobody seems to care. I know that's not true, but it, it can kind of grind you down a little bit, especially when you're trying to do something new. Like, well, I'm sure you had the same problems when you were starting. It's, it's just, it's, it's a bit difficult to kind of. To keep it is. I mean, uh, in my case, what now I've got a kind of a back catalog to look at. Clearly there are certain shows that do better and it's not, mm -hmm. it's partly the subject matter. It's partly the guest. So yeah, the last few weeks, the Adam Two show was really popular. The 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 Shattered Sword one about Midway was really popular. The one about Dead Man's Corner, so it brings in Hundred and First Airborne and Tanks and Germans was really popular. But yeah, people will generally give anything a try. Yeah, if they if they they, they I I would like to think and and you as well that people have got enough confidence in our product that even if they haven't heard of the battle and they haven't heard of the guest. They'll go, well, I'm sure I'll learn something. And I've had very, very, very few people say, you shouldn't have had that person on Dave were shit. I've never had that happen. I've never had anyone saying that was just ridiculous. I've had shows that are less popular, but right. people will take on board new things. But it's about the number. It's about 
on what level do you want to make the connection, isn't it? You know, again, I was on the YouTube today and there the I was looking up Operation Barbarossa because I've got mm. a show in Eastern Front Week about Barbarossa. Right, right. And there are some things on YouTube that have had, you know, two and a half million views. And I watched them and I go, yeah, it's just, you know, <laughs> and it's 15 minutes and it's going, yeah, well, it's all it's all very good, but it's, it's really a, a Wikipedia entry with animation is kind of what it is, you know? Pretty much. Yeah. And is there anything in depth in it? Is there anybody doesn't? And you can think, well, how, how can I get to that level? Um, <laughs> yeah. I but mean, yeah, you're... You're right. Like I see the same thing. Like I, because I when I first started, like the actual YouTube channel, because I've been doing the Twitter thing for a lot longer, um, so I didn't really think about these kinds of questions until recently. But uh, I go and I would just plug in stuff to YouTube, is because that's kind of what people tell you to do when you're first starting. And I'd see stuff. Some of it is good, but and then it's got a million views. And then I find something about the Canadian even army, right? And then I'd find something else that's really well done from whatever an organization or museum. It's got 10 people have watched it. So it's 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 a bit of a struggle, right? And it's a numbers game, as you know, right? You gotta you gotta build that critical mass because without it, it, you get lost in the again, the pond, right? <laughs> I said that yeah, I'm uh, a little fish in a very, very big pond, but yeah. And this is you know about this dilemma of if you're an author, you know, do you do you scroll away for 10 years on some obscure subject and sell it to a publisher who gives you 10 pence a copy and be lucky to send 200 copies in the first two years, but at least you've got it out there. And your work is there, or or do you kind of sell your soul to the devil and do another <laughs> book on the Dam Dusters or whatever it would be that would would sell? It's 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 complicated, but that's a big subject. Let's answer quite well. Maybe we won't be able to answer this one. It's from um, about the was the Cana were the Canadian military properly portrayed in the two thousand and six movie Black Book? I don't even know. I remember seeing Canadians in that movie. I don't even know what that movie is. That's the one. Black Book is the Dutch Resistance one, isn't it? Isn't it German Resistance? I don't know. So we don't know. So there we are. So sorry about that. One. We, don't, we don't know that one. That's a move, moving, moving along. Let's pretend that didn't happen. We'll edit that bit out in the non existent <laughs> edit. But um, yeah. Um, so someone, or someone answers. Sheldrake, Sheldrake knows what it is. He says Black Book has small errors in buttons and bows, but otherwise is good. At least it does portray the fact that Canadians liberated Amsterdam. So well done. Sheldrake's done our job for us there. there well we done. Thank you. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe Google helped him out there a bit. I don't know. Um, I mean, yeah, again, sorry, this is another aside, but it's, again, not just World War II, but the Canadian film industry is tiny to begin with, and then we've had hardly any war films, so I just, honestly, Passchendaele ruined Canadian war films for me, so I don't watch them. <laughs> Maybe I should start again, I don't know. But anyway, so that's just kind of, I haven't seen a lot of them. But I am interested to see the shelled one, I think that's coming out soon. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, we've got two questions. So Scott Grimwood, um, I'm a big fan of the film Corvette K225. Um, which is um, it's, it's it's that it's that it's um the guy the Western actor isn't it in that not yeah um, Randolph Scott is in that one isn't it yeah, yeah. It, it, I can't I I like it what do you, do you know is it known in Canada to people of no no so yeah like this is a two parter so the movie itself not really I mean there's a lot of those movies right like uh, the one that with James Cagney comes to mind about the uh, the uh, the air train. Oh, the, the air train. Uh, the, 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 oh, yeah. What's it called? Um, oh, jeez. Something. Yeah, I'm forgetting. Yeah. I'm around a blank. Uh, but anyway, I'm sure you can find it easily. Captain of the Clouds. Captain of the Clouds. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, so yeah, the, these movies were known at the time. Like they had the big, you know, premieres and whoopty doos and all that kind of stuff. But after the war, they kind of disappeared. Uh, but in terms of how the Royal Canadian Navy is remembered, I'd say it's it, it's uh, it's very well known. Uh, I mean, it's it's. The Royal Canadian Navy still has its place in pretty much all the major communities across the country. I mean, you're not even the ones on the coast, right? Like they all have a little naval reserve. Um, well, it's a ship, but they're, they're, they're buildings. But uh, so people are aware of that. There's memorials all over the place. Like my parents sent me pictures of one in London, Ontario, nowhere near any real water. And they've got a whole park for it. So I think it is quite well known. And, and I think a lot of that has to do with a lot of efforts done in the late 90s and the early 2000s, mm -hmm. particularly with the, uh, the Merchant Marine. There was a big push to get them recognized, and I think it worked um, because a lot of people know that story uh, very, very well of how difficult the Battle of the Atlantic was for you know uh, the sailors and and the merchant marine. So I think that's fairly well known as uh, as far as it can go in Canada, right? It's it's difficult, but we still have a few ships left. We have a Corvette left, which is cool. Um, but yeah, so I think it's it's pretty well known. The, the, I when I was still in England, so I th there was a TV, a Canadian TV movie called Lifeline to Victory came out. 
yeah. 1992, which was uh, about the Atlantic con co crossings and what have you. And I recorded it off the TV and converted it to DVD, but it's n I've never seen it again. Never been on DVD anywhere. Never been about. And that I'm. I mean, I've, I've still got it. It's a ropey old copy, but it's a really good. Little bit low budget. I mean, they film it on, on on the real the real ship there, but it's when it get the thing that gets it ends up docking in Liverpool or somewhere. It's clearly, it's it's clearly somewhere in Canada. It's clearly yeah. you know. Oh yeah, they filmed all that in Canada. Yeah, but it's really well. It's really well done, but just hasn't hasn't lasted. Hasn't. I mean, the the Dieppe mini series is a bit. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's poor really. Um, I mean, so yeah, I mean. It, we, you know, the Canadian movie industry hasn't really put much money into this, and the British movie industry hasn't. I mean, Dunkirk and that, and that divided people is really the only <laughs> World War Two movie British focused in the last decade or two. It's the odd TV thing here and there, but you know, yeah. it doesn't. I mean, it doesn't get the attention. Well, that's that's a good point because when that came out here, right, there's no Canadian forces technically involved, right? But there's Canadians in the in the Royal Navy. And they, they, they found a couple of the vets and they went to some of the, you know, the premier, premieres in there. I think it was in Winnipeg or something. They brought him. I mean, that's all we have, right? We had Passchendaele and that bombed. So it's, it's we kind of cling to what we can, you know? Yeah, well, that's another subject, the movie. But we've got a, a one from, from my old mate Rich Fisher at the Vickers MG collection about the can loan scheme. So how well known so is the can loan scheme across Canada? And just for those who don't know what it is, it, this is the... This is the assigning of Canadian trained commissioned officers to British forces. So you see it a lot in the cemeteries in Normandy. You'll see yeah. in the British cemetery, you'll see can loan officers. So he was Canadian, but he was attached to the Berkshire Regiment or the King's Own Scottish Borderers. So, yeah. Um, uh, so, how really, well is it known? Uh, and, really. and more importantly, how is it perceived? It's not, unfortunately. I think I saw uh, Sheldrake Six say, uh, "Do the Canadians know about you know dot dot dot?" And the, the questions with no. Uh, again, it depends on who you're talking about. Like enthusiasts know about can loan through and through. I mean, we we have uh, there's a memorial in where I live in Ottawa. Um, it's not. It's literally off the beaten path. Like I can't believe that. Like I can literally see that because <laughs> there's a path right there, but it's even hard to see it from the path. So it's. It's it's not that well known. I mean, people hear about it occasionally because you'll hear about, yeah, they, well, why was he there? You know, you, you'll get a lot of that, right? Be like, oh, he was fighting in North Africa. And then they go, well, why were there Canadians in North Africa? Or there was no Canadians in Arnhem, that kind of thing. Uh, so it's 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 not that well known until it kind of comes up or say, so like a, a vet dies, like that just happened uh, yesterday or the day before. Um, he was Cam Lone and just passed away. Uh, so it, it doesn't really come up. I think it's super interesting. I think people would I mean, really I, like it's it. interesting because, you know, me being Brit, you being Canadian, Canadian yeah. we might have very different perceptions of it because yeah. there's certain regimental histories I've got where if it wasn't for Cam Lone officers, we simply couldn't have fielded the, the units in the field. You know, you get these yeah. photos and six out of 18 officers within a company are, are Cam Lone officers. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I, from the Canadian point of view, did it not piss people off as fast no. as you're training these guys? They're being stolen no. for the Brits. Or, or, well, you would think you know. so, but but no, because, uh, and this is part of another video, I think it's coming out tomorrow. Uh, I talk about this kind of um, frustration in Canada, that they're not fighting. Like the Canadian army is not fighting. They're in England, right? They go to Hong Kong. Yes, I know about Hong Kong, obviously. <laughs> I know about Dieppe. Yeah, you don't have to tell me that with comments later. I know that. But there's no protracted campaigns until Sicily. So there's a lot of people outright pissed off. So they trained a lot of officers. We had too many. Nobody was pissed off. They were like, yeah, let's let them go. Then there was ones that were attached just for short periods to get experience. That happened as well. That's not part of the Camelon program. That's separate. But it, it, it didn't really piss people off. I think one the soldiers, sorry, the officers who were involved were very much welcoming of it. And, and it's just it kind of went to the wayside, right? Because they're still attached to their Canadian regiment, right? They're still Canadian soldiers. Yeah. Serving yeah, yeah. in British units. So it, it's 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 a weird identity thing. I mean, and it's a testament to the to the to the, to the ability to train so many people. It ties in with the air training yeah. plan is that, that Canada, with its relatively small population, was able to to yeah. to galvanize and mobilize to such an extent that you're not only providing enough officers, well-trained officers for yourself, you have enough to to, to supply us as well. I mean, that's well, which, yeah, incredible. it's amazing. I mean, it, that's something, again, I think is 
is forgotten. I mean, I've said this, I think, on your channel multiple times. The air training plan is probably Canada's biggest contribution to the war. Like, I, I don't see how anyone else could have done that. Maybe the United States, but I don't think they would have. They wouldn't have taken that on. So it's Canada's biggest thing. So that idea of training and who can do what for other people is huge. Like, we don't really think about that in the sense. But that's just one, and this is sort of connected, like you said. The air training plan is part of our wartime heritage. It's literally everywhere. I mean, there's tiny little yeah. airfields all over the country. The same with the training and the little regiments, right? But well, alas, it's, it's not sexy, though, is it? No. In that sense of it's, you know, the Captains of the Cloud was a propaganda film made in the war. But now, you know, yeah. as much as people are trying to bring it to people's attention, it's people want to hear about combat. They want to hear about jumping out of aircraft and flying over and the actual training aspect you read a book about whether it's the, the Australian Air Force, the 8th Air Force, the training bits is always kind of that. You, you kind of, yes, get me get me to the action. Get me to the sorties. You know, you, 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 that's our brains work that way, alas. And uh, and uh, you're right. It is probably your, your the, the Canada's greatest contribution to World War II and yet, and yet largely not known. Um, I want to go back and talk about, uh, HG talks about, asked about you to talk about the, the special relationship between Canada and the Netherlands and um, which is definitely there and, and I think generally the Allied veterans look upon the Netherlands fondly which we can touch on in a minute but I'll, I'll let you handle the Canadian aspect first. Yeah so that is the I was gonna wait for a question exactly like this before talking about that's the part that's probably known the best. Everyone knows in this country, uh, new Canadians, old Canadians, old people, young Canadians, yeah, like literally young children kind of thing. It's taught in schools. Like that's, you get Juno and you get the Netherlands, liberation of the Netherlands. Literally in Ottawa, we get the tulip bulb sent every year. <laughs> festival, everyone comes and looks at them. Like it's, it's huge. Like there's memorials sent from the Netherlands that are put in Canadian towns. Like London, Ontario, where I grew up has one from the Dutch people. So it's very well known that we have this connection. That's probably the one part that's known the best. Uh, and it, we are very, um, well, proud of it. I mean, it's it's one thing we talk about constantly uh, when it comes to the war, whether to the detriment of other parts, I won't say, but uh, it, it's very well known. And it's uh, there's always stories, right? When, when well, back when you could travel, people going, Canadians going to the Netherlands with the, you know, the Canadian flag on their backpack and getting treated like family in these tiny little Dutch towns, right? Like that's a, kind of a ubiquitous story in Canada. Mm. So I think that it's that's the one part that's 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 very well known. I think my, what I want to comment on that is the bigger question is why are uh, the veterans, Canada, Canadian, British, American, perceive that the Dutch welcome them better than perhaps the French do? Why is there <laughs> this this? As under, I mean, I, I, my answer to that is when I when people come up to me, you know, while Bill Garnier. Yeah, I loved him to bits. Easy Company, Band of Brothers, always tell me how grateful the Dutch were. He said when he would come to the, the Europe, he, he he kind of half enjoyed the Normandy leg, half enjoyed the English leg before that. Really loved the Netherlands leg, hated the German leg of the Band of Brothers. That was his. That was how it was. And and I would say to me because part of it is for me is when the Allied army arrived in the Netherlands, whether you're talking about airborne, whether you're talking about grounds, the 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 tide has turned. That the, the it's clear now the Germans are going to lose the war. It's, 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 yeah. Whereas Normandy, by contrast, is still, we know as historians that the writing was on the wall, but the suddenness of Normandy, the paratroopers arriving at the middle of the night, the, the feeling that it might have not worked is living in Normandy as I do. The French were a little bit cautious about showing their complete appreciation immediately because yeah. they don't know what's going to happen. By the time you get to the Netherlands, it is a bit more certain. So that's my take on it, as the, as the Dutch could be a bit more um, extroverted in their celebration. Yeah. Um, what's your take? Yeah, I think I, I think you're right. I mean, the context, <laughs> here comes the PhD historian out of me again, is, is important to that. Um, well, you, like you mentioned, right, uh, Market Garden, and then there's the, 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 the Hunger Winter, which yeah. uh, is so... It's heartbreaking. The stories are utterly, utterly heartbreaking. Uh, but it's 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 interesting to read because that's part of the context of all of this, right? Like, yeah, I've read accounts literally uh, of what I think it was the the my relative that I've talked about on the channel before who was killed at Juno, the Shadir War Diaries, literally talking about yeah. like these people's houses on the beach are destroyed and they're literally cheering as they're running by. 
like you don't hear that right as part of the, the the normandy narrative but you do for the netherlands right you know their celebration there's flowers and flags everywhere i i think the hunger winter plays a huge part in that because they literally came in and were literally saving lives like it was at that point that these people were starting that's true so bad. I, think, yeah, I think the winter has a has a lot to, to i think it has a big I mean, part of that to do yeah I mean, here, here's another, I'm going to throw something slightly controversial out there because hey, okay. I can. It's a free. It's a free chat. Is that you <laughs> yeah. know another another possible response when people say how wonderful the Dutch are with Allied veterans is that we can also say they did provide quite a lot of SS volunteers. The Germans, the Netherlands. I mean, more than the French did. Uh, more yeah. than other. You know. So I'm not saying that that has any bearing on that conversation. I'm saying, but it, it as in all of these situations, there's a wider picture that needs to be taken on board. And to to it to say that every single Dutch person loved the Allies is not fair. To say that every French person was a bit grumpy when the Allies arrived is not fair. There's a <laughs> there, there are there are these little stories that veterans say of, about how how their experiences were. And for some reason, there is a real affection for the Netherlands. And 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 maybe the Dutch are slightly more open as a people. I don't know. They're very they're very chilled out. Look at their attitudes to drugs and sex and rock and roll. I don't know. <laughs> maybe you know. I don't know. I mean, and yeah, just kind of jumping off what you just said, I know there's parts of the Netherlands because they, when they did the, um, I forget what they called, when they went back in 2005, uh, certain parts were the same, you know, flags and, you know, kissing the babies and, you know, so the babies could see the vets just like when they did the liberation. And then there's other parts in the north, they got no reception because they were not that welcome because of what they had to do, right? They blew the the dikes right? and it caused widespread destruction and not every Dutch person was thankful for that. So, I mean, that's something to remember too. It's just going to throw another fly in the ointment. It's not every Dutch citizen of the time or now is going to be like, yay, Canadians. Like some of them, like you destroyed mm. where I lived. Anyway, it's it's like happened. all these things. There's, there's levels of nuance there. I mean, I'm, 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 I, I'm not necessarily agreeing with what HG says here, but because the difference between the French and Dutch also with the fact the French defeat was really a disgrace for the country. Uh, and being liberated was fine. But I, I don't know that I would use the word disgrace. I mean, yeah, that's a bit much. I mean, it's, it's a, it, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing necessarily. I don't know that I would use that word myself. And of course, yeah. as we've discussed, we, 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 you know, we, we, with France, we've got France at war week coming up on World War II TV, quick plug in October. It's very complex. Stephen Bork, an American historian, be one of our guests then talking about his book about the bombing of, it's called, you know, about at war with France, implying that essentially the Allies in their, in their bombing of France effectively declared war on the country. Even though France, which technically was an occupied country and the government was in exile, yeah. is an ally. It's very complex. Um, it's extremely complex. I mean, I don't think we want to go down that that um that rabbit hole now. What I I do want to talk about a really good question, which um I find it now um from Sean Brennan, is did Canadian units have differences of equipment and TOE with the British Army, or did they just copy British arm, Army arms and organizations? The simple answer is a bit of both, but we can expand on that. Um, yeah. I mean, sorry, go ahead. Well, I mean, uniforms equipment. Yes. Broadly the same, although yes. Canadian had their own manufactured stuff, Correct. including their own Lee Enfields and Bren guns and stuff like that, man manufactured under license in, 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 in uh, helmets the same. The, the, yep. the structure of the divisions is broadly the same. Um, but yeah, there I mean, are differences. Um, uh, yeah, but they're minor. I mean, there's there's a lot of work being done on this, right? Um, particularly now, talking about the interconnectedness of the Commonwealth. I mean, you uh, you have they're all going to the same schools, right? Like the you know you know in uh, Imperial War College, all that kind of stuff. The training's similar. Uh, they're using literally the same books. I mean, we got the the, the bilingualism here, which caused a lot of problems um, for the French soldiers. Uh, but that's the problem, right? They're using British sources that are not in French. Uh, but anyway, that's another rabbit hole we'll try to avoid. Uh, but uh, it, it, it's similar. Um, but again, it's kind of situational, right? Like we are using different stuff depending on where they're fighting, right? And I keep coming back to Kiska because I think it's just super interesting. Yeah. But they kept the Canadian uniforms because they were fighting under U.S. command, but they used U.S. weapons and then also went under U.S. organization to fit in better, right? Yeah. And it makes sense. It makes perfect sense why you would do that, right? Especially if it's only one uh, 
uh, one brigade, uh, right? Same with Normandy. It didn't, like I've seen this discussed elsewhere. Like why would Canada set up its own system of line of communications? Why would they? It doesn't make any sense. Why would we make that a thing when we can just more or less copy what Britain's already done and use the ones? I mean, yeah, there's some American use we made weapons and things like that in Normandy that they have to convert before they go over and that kind of thing. But it, it's more or less the same. Uh, and, and it's done for convenience. It's done, some of it's for tradition. I mean, we still use the British traditions today in the Canadian military. I think we have more Highland regiments than Britain does. I mean, mm. it's a it's a cultural thing uh, as well, because I, I to me, I mean, I've gotten in trouble for this before, but I think that ingrained Britishness is so important to Canadian armed forces, uh, even today, yeah. if we're not even willing to recognize it. But but like this is a practical example of, of that. Well, I'm going to just uh, answer this question because Mark Loop, who I think I pissed off on a previous show, is asking about <laughs> Air Force questions. I don't. I, I'm I'm trying to host that. I haven't. I haven't deliberately missed any Air Force questions. If there are some, they must be back a bit. Um, well, we talked about the Air Force, but okay. I, don't, um, I mean, I was a member of the Guild of Battlefield guy. That's another story for a separate day. But I can't. Where well, I can't remember going back and seeing any Air Force questions. I don't think Look, there was. I, Mark may have already buggered off. I don't know. But we can talk about the Air Force. I mean. One, one thing I was going to add to your thing about the, the, the difference between, or differences and seminaries between the British and the Canadian Army, it seems to me, because of the, the comparative smallness of your population, there's a little bit more harmony between the Canadian Air Force Army and Navy, maybe more so than in Britain. I mean, I don't know what I would be basing that on. I don't know how you'd quantify or measure that. But I think about... The, the connections between you read accounts of like the Canadian infantry in Normandy and the Canadian uh, Spitfire and Typhoon squadron seems to be more of a, of a sense of being on the same team a bit that maybe I don't know that you could always universally was the same with the British. I don't know. What's your feeling on that? Uh, it's hard to say, right? Because uh, from the accounts, right, uh, from on the fighting, right, they hardly even know what's going on half the time. So, like, they don't know who's protecting them and who's not. Because, uh, again, like you said, Canada's small. They make a huge contribution. But just because it's a Canadian group, sorry, well, we'll do the Air Force. Like, it doesn't mean it's all Canadians, right? Like, there's Canadians all throughout the RAF. Yeah, true. During the entire war. There's Brits, fl you know, flying the planes in the Canadian squadrons. It's, 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 a, it's a connection. Yeah, is there maybe? I mean, I, that's not something I've really thought about, to be honest with you. I mean, because the Navy's kind of doing their own thing with the convoys and the stuff in the Pacific and then, you know, Bomber Command and, and Fighter Command and all of that's kind of got its own thing going on for most of the war. Um, but I, I, I don't think it's, I mean, I don't really have anything to kind of dispute what you said, uh, but it's, uh, I know in the pre-war times, they do not get along at all. <laughs> like mm -hmm. I mean, maybe it was, a, maybe that's just my judgment. I'm I'm, I'm just, scrolling just, back. I'm trying to find a, an Air Force question. I I haven't found one yet, so I'm not sure what I haven't answered or we haven't answered. I'm supposed to, but I I'm scrolling back and I can't find one. Uh, JD from the History Underground said, "If we had you had I had unlimited money, what Canadian war movie would we make?" That's quite a good question. Oh, that's. I know what one. you're going to say. Well, no. Well, I could, but I'm not going <laughs> to. Okay. I thought you were going to say Hong Kong there immediately. No, no, no I'm not. Uh, I mean, yeah, but no. <laughs> yeah, but no. Yeah, but no. Yeah, I mean, that would be great. But I mean, I, I'm thinking more. I mean, there's, there's so many stories that have come across. Like to me, I would do, again, maybe this is my other bias because I'm, like I said earlier today, I think on Twitter, like my Normandy obsession. I would try to do something like a small unit in Normandy and go past the D Day, you know tripes and tropes and everything i think there's so many great stories you know like taking out the first panther tank you know in brettville like that should be a movie <laughs> like why is that mm. not a movie like that's what i would do like there's so many stories here that i think should be told and other than academic texts so that's what i would probably do, do i think the, like, i'd, I'd like, like i'd like through. to see an italy theater miniseries yeah that would be that really maybe could too. touch not just on the canadians but new zealand as british as yeah. well i think I, I know Peter Caddick Adams spoke on a recent thing about the fact that there is theoretically this Monte Cassino movie directed by John Irvin of Dogs of War and other fame coming. He's the historic advisor on it. It's based on his book. Yeah. Um, I hope that happens. Um, but the Italian campaign, I think, would be a, would, despite me living in Norm, probably my choice for a 10 part miniseries. But whether I want to see it 10 parts about one one unit or whether I'd like to mm -hmm. see more of a 
coverage of different i don't know i think i'd like to see everybody represented if i was being you know, the indian army and the well yeah you could do that with money casino right but I yeah mean, or tona i mean well tona would be good that would be um, a hell of a show i mean the battle i mean i did a very short thing with some of the filming i found because they had a film unit in the fighting which is insane I mean, some of the toughest Canadian fighting were Tona, and then also Saint Lambert has film crews there. Yeah, no, there's some good footage from there. Crazy. Yeah, and um, um, well, 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 I mean, just Matt Matt Bone, who's in the pub. So Matt, I think, has already <laughs> um had a couple of um uh jars, and he's a Canadian, of course, living in Britain, so he's a traitor. And it, is, but, and it is Thursday. Yeah, they right? were Canadian Typhoon Squadrons were absolutely amazing, Matt. <laughs> Where would we be without the Canadian Typhoon Squadrons? I mean, we would be in a sorrier world. That's absolutely the case. So, <laughs> so Mark Lube, if you have gone off to watch something else, I'm not really, I really, I'm not sure what question I've missed or we've missed about the Air Force. Um, but you know, whatever. If we're free willing this. I mean, we didn't have a plan. Um, being like, no Air Force. I'm a bit grumpy. Um. Yeah, but um, um, so yeah, there's there's lots of um. Oh, someone just mentioned that the deceased actor Leslie Nielsen was enlisted in the Royal Canadian Air Force yeah, at night, in 1943. He never saw combat, so um, that's interesting. Um, yeah, I think I, I could go back and scroll through some things there. Um, James Jeffries, the wonderful James, is saying that 20% of bomber command were made up of Canadian personnel, uh, which is 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 worth reminding ourselves of, and and as great as those. Those 1950s movies are the appointment in London and Angels One Five. There, there's, I'm not going to say they don't have non-British representation. Mm. There's always the one, right. but it often is just the one. There's one. the token Aussie or the token Canuck or the token whatever. Six three three squadron, of course, has the has the Sikh, doesn't it, in a turban? Um, yeah. For tokenism, I mean, it's, it's got the really in there. I mean, thank, it, brilliant. I mean, it's not many films I can think of that have Indian aircrew in them, but it's all a bit singular to just make the point there the dam busters of course which is an incredible film but there's i think yeah. there's one aussie actor and i think those playing canadians are probably british or, or there's oh, there's yeah. the american characters there's the american pilot johnny but yeah there's not much no it, it's not really i mean not much representation of the dominion in in the classic war films um well, i think i found the question that upset um mark loop uh, Did you? About Bo, uh, Buchenwald, Bo, yeah, I can't talk. Uh, Buchenwald, uh, the last airman or something. I think we missed that. Uh, okay, I found it. Found it. Was what was, what was the, what was the question? Let's okay. even if he's gone, let's answer it anyway. Just to, <laughs> to, to, I think they were asked if they were known, like if they're known in Canada, not necessarily about their story. Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, if you told Canadians there was Canadians in a concentration camp, uh, they'd go, what? They'd have no idea what you're talking about. Um, like, we know about the camps. Obviously, we just got a Holocaust, uh, Holocaust memorial in Ottawa the last couple of years. But uh, no, I mean, we know, and I didn't want to talk about this, and maybe it's good to do it at the end. But like, Bomber Command is known, and that's unfortunate the way it came about because of the valor and the horror, which I'm sure you've heard about a thousand times. I can talk mm -hmm. about that for a week straight because it was been a big part of my dissertation and going forward but the the way they presented bomber command and all that kind of stuff is how people came to really learn about that in the early 90s and that's kind of stuck so that's the stories that are known right it's either yeah, yeah they were doing their best or they were you know sent to their deaths as sacrificial lambs kind of thing I, i'm going to change the subject slightly because i just i just am and um I'm, I'm noticing how, how i'm looking very pink today it must be because i'm drinking <laughs> alcohol while uh, while doing the show be, which yeah. is why. Um, one of the things that I think is very interesting about the Canadian aspect of the Battle of Normandy um, mm -hmm. is how relatively easy it is to study and follow. I think this has come mm -hmm. up in the past because, you know, if 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 you get if I get a tour group or someone and and they they, they really only know a bit about Normandy because of Longest Day and or Saving Private Ryan, they want to get to grips with it. And you you know you you, say, you and they say where shall I start? You go well, you know, there's so many possible angles. Yeah. You know? But yeah. one convenient thing about the Canadian Army is they are more or less landing in one place and going in one straight line towards one final objective. And you can pretty much aim your car southeast <laughs> and follow the Canadian Army in Normandy. You can't do that with the American Army because some go up to Cherbourg, some go off to Brittany, yeah. some go south. You can't do it with the British Army because you've got the Combat, you've got the Gold Beach, and then you've got units that were in the Gold Beach so they go off to Operation Good, but then go back again to the other yeah. sector there. It's very all over the place but the canadian the canadian route is is easy to follow and not 
only that, we have that wonderful series of monuments that Terry Kopp and his Battle of Normandy yeah. Foundation put up that guide you with not just the memorial plaques, but the information panels and uh, and and Mike Beck yeah. told brilliant maps in the in the Canadian what's that book called the Canadian Guide the Battle of Normandy yeah. whatever it's called. I got it somewhere here. Oh, yeah. I think I've got two editions. I've got the old little little one. I've got that one there, the Visitor's Guide, which is really really good. Oh, and amazing. there isn't really an easy equivalent of that for the British Army or an American Army because I say you'd have to pick on you'd have to pick one corps or one yeah. one unit. So the Canadian. Uh, uh, Understanding the Canadians in the Battle of Normandy is, I would I would suggest, relatively easy as a starting point. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's almost literally a straight line because they're, they're once the fighting past Khan, once Khan is taken, or the rubble of Khan is taken, uh, it's literally following the Khan plays road, right? And it's pretty much a straight line. Yeah, <laughs> as the you know Norman roads were back then outside the villages. Uh, so it's it is it makes it easier for someone like me when they were when i was new to all of this to study and understand and how the things literally progress right like because we have third division which comes in but it's not under canadian command yet then you have the second canadian corps comes active um with uh well guy simmons is in charge of that and i'm doing some work on uh uh, a very ridge right now because I'm having David O'Keefe on tomorrow. Um, but uh, oh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. And, and then that activates, and then you have Kriar and First Canadian Army come in, and then, then you have the things like tractable and total sorry, totalized, then tractable, and then closing the gap. Uh, and again, the closing of the gap is fraught with controversy. I mean, I think I saw someone that we that wrote the polls, and I get in trouble from Jenny Grant about this on Twitter a couple of times. That she's like, up the Polish content, so I'm, I'm doing my best. Uh, but I think that was about the Netherlands. But it's the same with Normandy, right? Like, it's mm. known, but it, it, in the, some Canadian circles, it's uh, it's like, we only did it, right? It's one of our, you know, we did it, you couldn't do it, we did it kind of things, and we love doing mm. that. I hate it, but that's what we do, um, which is unfortunate. But yeah, you're right. It's a, It makes for literally a great narrative. If that's what yeah. you want to do. And I think the histori literally do historiography it. aspect is probably easier to study as well because the yeah. the Valor and the Horror, for all of you dislike about it, it was it's it 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 represents a period of how Canada appeared to study its own history that you can now measure the period before that, the influence that had and what has happened since then. The people, the work of people uh, like Tim Cook. Uh, since then to reevaluate and others and Terry Carp and Mike Bechtold and, and yourself now as a, as a, 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 in this in this field there is there's a good body of work uh, to look at now about how Canada has examined its role in Normandy and in World War II and you can say well that's that phase where we thought this that's that phase where we kind of thought yeah. that I don't know we've got kind of as clear an idea from a British point of view of where our historiography phases are and americans i would certainly say haven't really got to grips with their phases <laughs> no. like canada has and that's not saying it's just saying the historiography aspect i'm talking about particularly yeah i mean yeah you're right i mean there's because tim cook just did a book on this it's released last year or i can't remember exactly when but it's amazing it literally looks at this it goes from this admiration during the war to literally after the war everyone's like who cares we're done with this let's focus on our lives comes back when all these vets start to retire and then you have a bit of a clash on what that looks like uh and, and then you that leads to things like valor and the horror and then you have new scholarship coming up and i would say the outcome of the valor and the horror is overall positive because it ignited a lot of people outright pissed them off being like that's not what happened or yeah you know, it, it, or you, you it, it provoked letter stern letter writing at the very least <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. Like, but it, it like well it's led to indirectly to what i did because my supervisor that but he did like he was pissed about the hong kong stuff and that's how i got going uh but anyway so yeah like you're right that we have this way of looking at it i mean it's there i don't think it's prevalently known but it's there and, and, but people i would say would know like yeah in the 70s probably they're like yeah we didn't even do much because of the whole mm. anti-war thing and all that but then probably in the 90s people started noticing this especially yeah. after the 50th in normandy right like that was a huge catalyst i mean i've seen it the reagan speech just piss so many people off in Canada. Like I've seen letters and, you know, all these news clippings and everything. Everyone's just super pissed about all of it. So that kind of gives it a jump start. So, yeah, I think you're right. Which is, great, which is, is interesting because it's so revered by Americans <laughs> and I probably by Brits as well. But that's, yeah, which is, a, which is, 
why I'm kind of laughing at it, right? Because it's, it's so funny how it's perceived, right? And I haven't looked into this like at all. It's just literally when I'm looking for other things, it keeps coming up, right? It's one of those things that it's maybe not your topic, but it's following mm. you through the archive, which I'm sure other historians have had. And it just, it kept happening. And I'm like, I don't care about Reagan, <laughs> but his yeah, name yeah. kept popping up, so, especially with CBC, because I was doing the Valor and Horror uh, for the dissertation. So it, it kept coming up. But uh, yeah, it, I think you're right. There, We've got this sort of, structure that we nobody made but it's there and i think that's mm. a good thing so well we've got yeah. some quick, some quick quick kind of hopefully kind of one or two sentence answer questions so i think we know this one already so what would we he describe as the greatest contribution of canada so i think you said that that's the air training plan isn't it yeah i would yeah i mean from the country as a whole who could do it i would say like i like to think about it that way like what other country could do that britain certainly not canada could and i think that's that's huge um, this is a good, I think Willie asked this earlier, but he's come back <laughs> on again. So do you think the sacking of Major General Kitching after 21 days is justified? Do I have to answer that fully? <laughs> no, you can, you can do some kind of politi politi politicians. Uh, well, the question that's better to ask is this one and just answer a different question. If you want. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, no, I personally, no, I don't think so. I mean, it depends on what lens you take from this. If you're trying to understand Simmons, then yes. If you're trying to understand Kitching, then no. If you're trying to understand on the ground, it's murky. My gut says it was premature. Uh, and he got a bad rap uh, based on things after the war, which people try to separate. I disagree with, especially with Simmons, because this isn't the first time he did that. He was really, really good at trying to twist narratives. So, I mean, it's, it's, uh, I think it was, it was too early and they should have let him. Develop that. that 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 raises that whole question about about again you look at what normally campaign you know perhaps there were some american commanders who people persisted with long and right. they should there were some british who were who were relieved too quick it's it's the football coach dilemma isn't it it's that yep. you know do you give them time to keep you know they're losing a few games do you give them longer or do you do you bite the bullet and get someone new in who has to it, it, there's no right answers to this and you can no. find many cases of commanders being left in too long who weren't very good. And equally, you can find the ones who the, the, the guillotine came down too quickly. But then in, in any of those cases, you can only take it with what happened. You can't then say, well, what would he have done? They're the counterfactuals of what he would have done if he stayed or what. It's it's hard to draw complete conclusions on those things. We have I mean, to just go up, by what, what happened. I mean, it comes up all the time, right? Especially with, with Canadians. I mean, it's a bit bigger, but you know, Criar in charge of first Canadian army. And it's always, well, Simmons, what if Simmons was in charge? How would have that gone? Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, we don't know. We're not going to know. Yeah. He was in charge of the first Canadian army for the show, but that's different. So it's, it's hard to say, especially because you have people that are fans of one or the other. I mean, these guys weren't very likable at the time. I mean, I think I read Criar basically had no friends, which is unfortunate, but, and then Simmons yeah, just rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. Um, I, we'll, we'll, we'll leave that one because I don't think there's any definitive answer. But what a really good question from Susan Yu there is how was life for First Canadian Canadian First Nation Canadians after they returned from the war? And I, I'll let you answer, but I'll I'll pre I'll say my bit. I one of the bits that I found particularly well, all of Tim Cook's book about the historiography of Canada and I found interesting, but I had in my head an, an image of Canada as being much more welcoming and nice and polite because I how and the way that the Jewish population was treated pre-war surprised me. The hostility towards First Nation people sort of in past kind of surprised me because it wasn't what I as a Brit kind of thought about Canada generally. And I was really surprised about that. But what, what with regards to the First Nation, what, what's your response? Because I, 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 I'm, I'm really interested. Uh, the short answer to start it with is, is terrible. Um, the treatment's always been terrible. Um, I didn't want to make this about, you know, current events or anything, but the, the residential schools, which has just come up, I think we talked oh, about God, yeah, that's, that's on, a... on the, on the Juno live stream. Um, Cause that was the, the monument, right. At Juno beach center. I mean, I can't keep the first world war out of this. Like the vets who served in that were treated terribly. I mean, they went back to home, which is what we call reserves uh, land, shitty land that they gave them to get them out of the way. Um, life was terrible. I mean, it was terrible for so many. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people know the story of Tommy price like that to mm. me one man obviously one individual doesn't tell the whole story but the way his life went after the war i mean after korea too because he served in both and he's decorated and he had to pawn his medals 
because he had trouble with, um, well, I, not can not a doctor and well, not a doctor in that way, but uh, uh, like PTSD and all that stuff, and suffer from alcoholism, right, and dies young. Um, so it's it it's it's just the government treatment of of the vets is is abhorrent, um, is the best way I can think about it um, to, to the First Nations and to the Indigenous veterans, and there are so many of them, and they're serving, and I've said this before on multiple occasions, they're serving a country that did not serve them, and that's something we cannot forget, and. Yeah. Um, I'm sure people are going to get upset about me saying this, but it's just not done properly. It was never done properly. It's it's horrendous. We need to uh, look at this. And again, yeah, you mentioned that I think it was the, the St. Louis was the boat uh, with the Jewish refugees that we turned away. It wasn't the only time we did that. We did that multiple times to multiple people. We did it on the West Coast too, um, all the time. And Canada is not this country of happy, smiling, polite people all the time. We have our dark, dark past that we try to move, we try to ignore. And there's a reckoning coming with that um, right now. And it, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's really the way it should go. And, and I think the, the Indigenous veterans question is perfect because they were not treated well. I mean, again, like I said, the, look up Tommy Price if you've never heard of him. I'm hoping to do something on him at some point in the future. There's a, there's a great graphic novel that was published yeah. a few years ago about him that I, I haven't actually read, but it's it, no, it, it highly regarded. Um, and I suppose this, this now expands on the the wider story about the the reluctance or acceptance of teaching all of our bad history and it's slavery it's racism it's statues yep. it's it's causes that has been as much part of the news in the history world the last few years as actually the history itself it's the representation there's this you know the, i get emails now about statues and you know and it's complicated it's 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 difficult and it's uh, there are no easy answers to these questions and it's it's something we'll have to kind of move through uh, collectively and understand that you know learning from the past yeah. is learning all the shit stuff as well as the, the the better stuff but it it does provoke strong emotions and yeah it's, it, it is fascinating right, I, think I, I call them tommy uh, Price, I got the Hong Kong in my brain. Uh, it's Tommy Prince. Prince, yeah, 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 yeah. He's easy to find. Um, he comes up. Uh, well, I mean, his stories are just <laughs> again. It's like if it wasn't on these history websites, like uh, Canadian Encyclopedia has one on him, uh, and it's vetted and checked. You'd be like, "This is fake. You made this up." Like he would do things just to mess with the Germans, like mentally, like just because he could. He was that good. Uh, it's just, it's I can't tell the story justice. So do look it up. He's no, there's not. I mean, it's and there's lots of. There's lots of nuance to this story as well. Is that you know I know someone who's doing a book about uh, American airborne troops again, and it's whether it's now appropriate to refer to the fact that some of the Native Americans were called chief by their buddies, like yeah. some people are called Tex or whatever. And it's like, and again, I don't know quite what the right answer is there. That is what they called him at the time. Was yeah. it? Would we? Would we accept someone calling? I, I don't know. It's it's complicated. I mean, I I, yeah. I remember. Because people know I've got particularly interest in the first airborne reconnaissance squadron at Arnhem. They had a a, a a black guy, and I don't I I couldn't tell you where he was born. I believe he enlisted in Liverpool, and he was a black guy. He was worked on the on the docks Liverpool. He joined the first airborne reconnaissance squadron. His name was Bolton Trooper Bolton, but his nickname to everybody was Darky because he was darker coloured, and that was how he identified himself. That's when he went to reunions. He would. They would be chalky white and blanco smudge of this, and 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 he 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 had his name, that, and there was I forget which book it was. They decided not to use his nickname in the book, and I completely understand that. And it's yeah. it's 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 like the dog in Dan Busters that <laughs> we, we, we've come up, but it's hard. It's hard because that was the identity with which he fought. That's yeah. it was meant with affection. It was meant, you know, and it's. These are these hurdles that I, that I understand people get very, you know, just call him what it was. I understand that argument. I also understand the sensitive argument, and I feel there's some kind of compromise somewhere in the middle, but it's very complicated. I mean, yeah, there, I'm not saying I have an answer to any of this, uh, even in the Canadian context, like the same, the chief thing is the same. Uh, it happens all the time. Uh, it, it is what it, I mean, it happened, but I don't saying, I don't know, I don't have an answer. If I was, say, personally writing that book, I'd probably take it out. Uh, but again, I would, or maybe I would leave it in one reference and then you leave it in once at the beginning and say yeah. he was identified by this, yeah. and then when you refer to him again, use his surname. Maybe would but be anyway. It. So yeah, it's 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 no easy answer. But I think as Sheldrake yeah. says, most indigenous soldiers were called chief, which we would not say now. That's no, we would not. But that I mean, 
Yeah, I mean, this is connected to, I was going to say, but I think Scott just brought that up. Yeah, um, about the, you know, the dark parts of Canadian history. And this connects to the Second World War. We did things that were uh, horrible, reprehensive, um, and we can't ignore them. Um, we made mistakes. Uh, they did things that were not good uh, and treated people poorly. And this is all part of the story. This is all part of, you know, the, you know, the, the, the glory of Juno Beach and, and, you know, liberating the Netherlands and all this stuff. There's some nasty bits and, and they're part of this. I mean, I'm um, getting not to plug my own stuff, but I did uh, a live stream, I think, last week with David Boris, who wrote about um, civilian affairs soldiers mm. and, and talking about, we were talking about uh, after the war in the Netherlands and kind of, again, this kind of go back to the Dutch question. But after a while, they're like, yeah, go home. Thanks, but get out of here. You know, we're tired of you guys. And some of the things that happened and it's like with murders and sexual assaults and, you know, stealing and all this stuff, it's, it's it's nasty and it, it's part of the story. Um, so I think it's in my own work. That's something I'm not going to you know brush aside. It's 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 always about why you're bringing these stories up and for what purpose. And yep. you know this. There was that book by an American woman and valid stuff about all the rapes and murders done by American troops in Normandy or in Europe. And it's like, well, yeah, there were some because there's 60 million people in uniform, and so a percentage of them are going to be weirdos and murder doesn't stop because there's a war going on. Crime doesn't stop. Rape doesn't stop. In fact, rape, rape probably gets worse. Um, so, but, the, but it was the fact that this particular woman, as I recall, she kind of brought this book out to time. It's where, which whichever anniversary it was, the 70th anniversary. And was, I was still going on chat shows and things in, in June when we're in a period of commemoration. It was like, okay, I appreciate what you're trying to do here, but I'm not sure that this is the arena or the or the time to talk about that. And yet, yeah. the research seemed to be good. It's just it's interesting and it's complicated. And yeah, we are doing a show, Tim. So we have got a show when um, oh, when cool. uh, Mark sorts out his internet connection because Mark did a show about Allied women in World War II, and he's got a show. Mark Turner has got a show prepared about crimes committed by uh, American soldiers in World War II. We're just waiting to reschedule it when he's got his internet connection, his new laptops with that. But we have we have done that. Um, and, um, yeah, Paul Reed is saying well, Trooper Bolton was born in Liverpool and it was, was West, West Indian heritage. So, okay, he was – but, yeah, I, I, I recommended the DCM, but he, he was known as Darkie. To his, but anyway, we, we, we probably get – get complaints now about using an appropriate language it's just which is par for the course and understandable um yep um we, we what well, it was a question i just saw i've got to go back and find it now um oh i think i know the answer to this is what do we think of the valor and the, and the horror um which for those who don't know was this sort of this very very well publicized very big promoted little series in what 90 92 early 92 that's sketched in my brain. Um, it's I, literally I think I've only ever seen the uh, Bomber Command episode and the one about Normandy. That I think they're the two I've the only two I've seen. Yeah, I mean, that stuff sketched in my brain. It was literally a chapter. It's unavoidable with Hong Kong, um, but also, again, like I said, stuff spills over Normandy Bomber Command. Uh, I think, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, puking emoji. Yeah, that sums up my feelings. Uh, I've seen the Hong Kong one. I don't even know how many times. In, in the discourse around it is it's not as bad. Um, it is. It's terrible. It's just as terrible as Normandy. It's just as terrible as Bomber Command. Why it's not seen as so bad is because the Canadian troops are seen in a more sympathetic light because of the POW years. You don't have that in the Normandy show. You have that a little bit in Bomber Command, but not even. I mean, because the, 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 the they're treated so poorly by the, the, the Japanese uh, is what most of that episode is even about. But I, I, for some reason, I know I'm a glutton for punishment. I like live tweeted watching the other two one time. Mm. That was a mistake. Uh, I think people enjoyed it and know to stay away. Um, I, I said, watch it with a grain of salt and then change my mind. So don't touch it ever. I think it's on Amazon Canada if you're you know crazy like me. It's not worth your time. It's just going to piss you off if you know lots about this stuff. It's There's just so much in it. That's just, I mean, Bomber Harris, this is stupid, but it, they don't even get him looking right. They didn't even use a guy with a mustache. I know it sounds stupid, but like that's so simple. <laughs> even back then, yeah, no internet. I get it. Um, yeah. But but as you said, we, we, without that, there yeah. wouldn't have been the pushback that wouldn't have maybe developed our understanding better, isn't it? It's the 
the amount of time is I know with veterans um, who you you try and get them to tell stories, and they were they were just they would circle around it and just go, yep. and then you'd show them a book that with a passage in it yep. that they disagree with. Suddenly yep. they want to talk about it. Now that's not how it happened. You you've yep. got to kind of poke the bear a bit somehow a bit. something well, that was a bit a... wrong so to get to get the reaction you know so that one poked the bear um because it literally led to lawsuits i mean there was a, a libel charge or sorry it's slander libel whatever charge against the mechanics that went to court yeah uh, i mean from members of bomber command and the different associations uh i mean it went to the u.s senate sorry the canadian senate which is Powerless, but anyway, <laughs> so it was just a big, you know, yeah. what that represents. And we had a question earlier about whether, what are the McKenna brothers still doing. I mean, because someone said they must be in their seven seventies, if not, yeah, you know, by now. And are they still making TV? Are, I mean, yes. did they? Unfortunately, they are. And sorry, I'm not. I don't like this. Is completely for the Canadian people. I don't like the pile on on CBC, which is a big thing right now. Um, but the CBC is still paying them, or the Canadian government and CBC was still airing. Um, a documentary by Brian McKenna as of 2016 uh, about, um, again, sorry, mm. First World War, uh, about the Newfoundlanders at Beaumont and Mel. And it's just as bad as you would imagine. It's awful. Um, and they're still getting paid. They did a, another small series that got hardly any attention, luckily, mm. uh, about kind of the Navy stuff. But again, yeah, they're still making stuff. I listened to a podcast that he did only about a year ago. He still thinks he's right. He still thinks he did nothing wrong. Uh, he still thinks he's doing everything correctly and wow. everything still stands up. So, I, I mean, I don't know if it's, uh, I don't but know. I mean, that, it does, it does bring know. up a question of will we, for example, as YouTubers want to go back in five or 10 years and edit stuff we've done because we will have been saying something, yeah. talking about something that we will get hang on. We, we can't say that now. We can't do that now that I, I don't know. I mean, one of my favorite series, which I admit has problems now, is the American Civil War by Ken Burns. You yep. know, Shelby Foote, who speaks <laughs> so wonderfully with his lovely voice. That's, but yeah, his, his politics, um, a bit pro-Confederacy and things like that, is problematic now. Yep. But do you re-edit the show, taking out anything that's that's using in pretty pro language do you not show it at all do you show it but with a kind of a warning at the beginning saying this has it's like um yeah you know, breakfast at tiffany's the movie with <laughs> audrey hepburn and the mickey yep. rooney ye yellowed up as a japanese guy do you take that bit out do you not show the movie i don't know what the answers are to these issues there mm. i me either i mean i don't it's... have an answer i mean i've been called out for like even bringing it up uh being like what's the point um I went, well, obviously, it's set the tone uh, for so many people. And it, it did so much, so much damage, but also some positives, like I said. But, yeah, like, what do you do? Like, um, it's, uh, I mean, it has, I've seen it with some warnings in front. They changed what it was called. It was literally called a documentary at first. Uh, they changed it to call it a docudrama. Docudrama, yeah. Which I even think is too far still. I mean, but also the part, and I'll just outright say this, that pisses me off the most about this is at the beginning of the Hong Kong episode, they say all of this is true. There is no fiction. They literally said that. And I go, that's not true. They literally made up passages from vets. Uh, one of the nurses, they took her words completely out of context, used it to film with an actor. It's just horrible. Uh, I'm sorry. It just it, it just pisses me off. Uh, it's just it's so bad, and some people still like it or think it's valid, mm. and it's just completely awful. Don't watch it. I think someone asked about was asking about it. Don't watch it. Yeah, I, I mean, and this is the this is the context thing, isn't it? About whether or not because context changes. Context the context mm -hmm. of what's appropriate now is. I mean, Stuart Lee, who was on my Spike Milligan show. I love Stuart. Lee. We exchange emails back and forth. My watch yep. is his show a couple of weeks, one of his shows a couple of weeks ago. And he talks about the fact he's, I think it was his dad. It's just obviously a comedy routine said the most offensive statement somewhere. And it was only nine words. And two of the, one was a pronoun. One was a so-and-so. And he said, I can't say it. Cause I, you know, I literally can't say it. But then toward the end of the show, he says, I have said all the nine words in that mm. phrase during the course of the show. So, yeah. com so the words are okay. It's the context <laughs> that makes them inappropriate. And that's the, 
that's a that's a, a ridiculous example in that sense. But what we're talking about World War Two, we can only give the views that we're doing as we're making programs in 2021, and we yep. don't know whether in 20 years' time there'll be a reevaluation of things we've said, and 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 language will have evolved, and maybe the the use of victims or Holocaust or something like that, there'll be a new term that will be yeah. the accepted one, and we kind of have to go back and. Yeah, I, don't know. I mean that's not like that's that's not my issue with like the Valorant Horror. It's not like it's not like that. Like it's offensive or no. anything. Like it's just it was terrible for the time, and it's going to be terrible forever. I mean it's just not even a good piece of history. And I'm not saying academically that they should have X Y Z. I'm not saying that. Uh, it's just it's a whole other ball game. And I think it's a Canadian like someone said context is important, and the Canadian context of the time plays into that. And it's complicated. I'm not saying I'm. This is just my opinion. I mean Tim Cook does a great job talking about it in his new book, but. Uh, no one's really looked at it in depth that way. And I think that's something we're missing. Yeah. And, um, well, I think we'll move on from that because it's very deep and very, and people are asking us about comments on other documentary makers. I think we'll kind of steer away from talking about contemporaries of that a little bit. Cause, but you know, it's, it, it the, these, the greater question of the responsibilities of being a YouTube filmmaker and a historian and it is, is a big one that will, is going to go on and on over the next few years. And, yeah, and yeah. I just hope that it doesn't mean that people end up not wanting to talk about history because of the fear of getting the terminology right, because of the fear of not upsetting anybody or upsetting, right. upsetting this group. But, you know, we, we need to still go back and understand the events of the past. And I hope people will, will, will understand that the books written 30 years ago were using different contexts and different things and different terminology. And, and that doesn't mean we can dismiss them completely. And yet in other terms, there are, there are certainly themes that I think I'm, I, I'm problem I have problems with of the, you know, particularly in my case, I don't like the sort of seventies, eighties era of the Germans being ex revered as being these efficient, willing, brilliant warmongers and the British and Canadians right. were slow and crappy and were always stopping for tea. That I'm glad that narrative has changed. But likewise, I don't want it swing to swing the other way to this idea that Germans were crap and we were yeah. brilliant. It's that's yeah. not it. That's any no no that's the equally incorrect. It's uh, Yeah, I mean you're right. We have the same sort of problem um here is we're either bashing ourselves saying we're terrible like japanese internment like we interned japanese canadians born citizens uh for racist reasons i'll just write that i'm not <clears throat> sure coding it but then we go the other way and they're canadian supermen you know they're landing on juno and they're gonna run to berlin just if the soviets didn't stop them you know it's 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 the same sort of thing it's 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 difficult and it's it's, it's not easy um none of this is easy um, but I, I agree with you i hope people don't get worried about that and tiny little details that don't matter. Like if you get the, you know, gun barrel wrong or mm, that kind of mm. thing. I don't like when people jump on people for that, that that's not cool. Uh, Cause it just limits again, back to this inclusivity thing. It limits people who are interested because all oh, you get one millimeter off and you get jumped on. What does that matter? It doesn't matter. So I think, I think you're right. We got to think about the way we do this and the way we go about it is, um, yeah, it's bringing people like, in is is the name of the game, and 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 yeah, and it's I get I get emails saying, can I can I have a look at these kind of reenactor made videos on YouTube? And you mm. look at them, and sometimes they're a bit pants, and you go, mm. but I kind of I, part of me wants to go, well, yeah, but at least you're doing something. You could be making, you know, you're trying to tell a story about World War Two, and they haven't got access to better uniforms, so they're using what they've got, and. It's it, it that that's complicated. I don't. I'm, I'm always kind of polite with my response, and yeah. you know, it's it's interesting. But um, here's a, here's a cool question: um, Was there any point in World War Two that Canadians <laughs> or Canada was thinking we are not going to win this war? <laughs> oh, geez, uh, that's a simple question. Uh, no, not at all. Uh, not simple at all. Uh, overall, no. I want to say no. I mean, there's the same sort of panic you see in the United States after Pearl Harbor. They think like the Japanese carriers are coming from Vancouver. They were never doing that. I think one Japanese sub shelled one lighthouse and hit mm. it like twice. That's it. And we had the balloon bombs, which some landed in like 48. Mm, 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 uh, mm. There's U-boat sinkings in the St. Lawrence. Um, but there's no, and there's a few German infiltrators that fail horribly. Uh, but other than that, there's no real, you know, threat. There is a perceived threat. And yeah, I was going to get to that as well because that brings up other things, right? After France falls, the Canadian thinking about the war changes. 
Uh, I don't want to talk about Mackenzie King too much. I uh, I don't dislike him. He's an interesting character. Uh, his diaries are interesting. <laughs> if you've ever read the Hitler passage, uh, oh my goodness. Uh, but anyway, he 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 changes his tone a little bit. He wants to keep Canada the war because he wants to hold on to power. He doesn't want to lose that in conscription. He fears conscription, like full out. Like I mean, Britain has it before the war. Canada fights tooth and nail over this. Uh, so we have conscription after uh, fall of France, but it's only within Canada. So there are fears that, that Canada might be attacked. Um, and then nothing ever obviously develops because the Pacific and the Atlantic are large, <laughs> which is a good bonus for North America. Uh, but yeah, like there's fear of it. Is it real? Like, is it based on reality? No, it's not. But there's no, I don't think there was, say, after 1941, you know, fears of, you know, German panzers, you know, rolling down the streets of like Kitchener or Saskatoon or anything like that. And it's, 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 it's also impossible to gauge the response or the feeling of an entire country because within a population, within even a, a, a small community, within a family, yeah. Dan's going to have a different opinion to mum. Little boy Johnny's going to have a different opinion to little boy yep. Billy. And, and so, and, and it's, and it's not constant. It's going to change day by day you know that's that if you were to be standing today as a rather well, the vox pop reporter in london through the blitz people would be giving a different response on monday than if on a wednesday you know if they've if yep. the, the bombers have missed and they've lots shot down they're very keyed up they're excited about the RAF. the next day there's a bomb fall and it's killed people you know you're downbeat you're gloomy it's not a it's not a constant and uh and and you know, as we've talked about a lot, I, I I feel forty-two is a pivotal year where a lot of things could yep. have gone the other way from where they did, and that's in all yep. countries, all theaters. You know that we know we know the the Midways, the Stalingrads, the El Alamains, the Battle of the Atlantic. That there's lots yep. and lots of knife edge moments um, in that year. Um, yeah, and Canada's happening. well, Canada's not really that much different, right? We have Dieppe unmitigated disaster um and i wanted to look at this a couple of years ago it just didn't end up happening but i think it's a good interesting case study is how the second division built itself back up because it fights in normandy right and yeah. what that looks like you know there's there's some that got back on the boats and got back to england uh it's a pivotal year for that because you have hong kong six months before uh so yeah that's not technically 42 but it's part of the whole japanese advance obviously uh, but it's, uh, it, it, yeah, I think you're right. This 42 pivotal year, uh, Canada's part of that. Um, we have uh, troubles with the convoys, right? At one point, they, the, the British government has said, you can't do this anymore. You can't protect them. So they basically send them back and tell you, you got to do better. You got to, you know, amp up and get the production up and get your guys better trained. And I think that was a big moment for a lot in Canada. And then again, once the their training plan really starts to get going, uh, after the early years, I think it's it's the same. I think you're right about 42 overall. Because again, I don't haven't just done Canadian history my whole life, right? I have a background in other areas, but uh, 42 is a big pivotal one for Canada as well. And then 43 is big for Canada, obviously, because of the Italian campaign. Yeah, of course. You know, and and uh, Mia the Chia just said there about the importance of understanding the past, and I think that's that, and the history is is, is of course is key, and and. You know uh, the 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 relationships between Australia and, and Japan and J yeah. China and Japan and North and South Korea and India Pakistan the Allies still what's going on in the Balkan Balkans and to to that's the uh, the ultimate thing is World War Two isn't just stuck in the past World War Two is still influencing everything even the trivial levels we've talked about of the the iconography and the, in the, uh, the when England played Germany in football and those kind of things, the, yep. the references to the back of the Britain that Alan Allport talked about world war two is still, if, if you, if, if you hum, if you hear the dad's army theme tune in Britain, <laughs> a certain representation yep. comes to mind, the, yep. the, 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 the bayonets fixed mentality. So world war two is influencing how politicians still make speeches. They still, subliminally and and overtly reference blitz spirit and d-day and and all those things there so it's you know it's not a question of understanding the past it's understanding of the past connecting to the present that connects very much to where we're going next well canada's no different in, in that way i mean we have the same sort of thing you always hear we don't want any we don't want another dep right yeah. if you're gonna put our troops under their command or whatever uh, and that came up a little bit with Iraq in 2003. Uh, like, we don't want another DF. We don't want another Hong Kong. I've seen Hong Kong recently with everything going on um, pre-COVID of 
hearkening back to that battle, being like, we have to fight for Hong Kong. That's certain politicians opinions and whatever, but they're still using that imagery that people know. And it's, it, yeah, like, I mean, World War II impacts Canada today in so many ways I don't think people realize. And it's just, it's it's a shame that we don't. Um, but yeah, it's like literally around us in our daily lives, like streets near me are World War II battles. People have yeah. no idea. Uh, it's just, it's really interesting. It's, I mean, it's, it, Mag and I went to, uh, we were in Malta a few, uh, four mm. years ago or something, and we did a tour of Gozo and, and we'd explained the guy I booked with and the, and the, the guy that we are both World War II buffs and his tour yeah, guide yeah. and stuff like that. And the, the area we were staying in um, had, for no reason, I don't think, it had streets. There was a Falaise Street. There was a Dieppe Street. There was a this, that. And, and when the guy brought us back through there, she didn't mention it at all. And I thought, <laughs> why? Did, did, did she not? Did she not? even registered that that's mm. what they were named after i don't know but it was just interesting that we could we're saying she, she's not going to mention this is she we're just going to drive down and we're sitting at lights and we're sitting at lights and there's valet's road there and dunkirk <laughs> road whatever it was then she yeah. knows what we're two months. she's not going to point out that but she didn't and and i don't know whether maybe it wasn't in her in her psyche i don't know it's right. By the way, an interesting sidebar conversation going about the 49th parallel movie which um, with Leslie Howard and and uh, everybody else, Lawrence Olivier and everybody um, hamming it up in many yeah. ways. Um, yeah. Great movie, I actually. Seen, I haven't or, seen that one in a long time. Yeah. Um, although I haven't seen it for a while, and um, that, that's interesting. But that's that 41, made in 41, but kind of probably would have been released a bit later and was probably summing up more a 42 feeling than the 41, but it was kind of looking forward and there's that German immigrant family or mm. uh, in, 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 and all that and the Nazis and raising a lot probably raising too many themes within an hour and a half long movie really it's trying yeah. to throw in every aspect but but definitely worth looking at again yeah. that film um well um we've got a question here then i think we'll kind of wrap things up and it's given yeah. the feelings towards the uk by canadians as mentioned on the chat was that respect impacted by the losses at dieppe and hong kong the refusal to make all canadian air crew into officers so that's kind of a a big a big question really from pat there Mm -hmm. Well, I can, so I'll do Hong Kong first because <laughs> I know it the best. Uh, yeah, I mean, you see it politically. I mean, this was a big part of what I looked at. There's this sort of pre-Hong Kong, you know, we'll go where Britain asks, basically. I mean, North Africa is a little complicated in that aspect. Uh, but after Hong Kong, they start to say no. And Britain, I've seen the, the, the papers, people talking to each other, letters going, why are they saying no all of a sudden? What's wrong? Like they just didn't see Canada as kind of separate in that sense or that they would always ever have the ability. Legally, they always did. Right. They could have mm. we could have declared neutrality and stayed out of it legally, uh, but they didn't. They could have said no the whole time. But you start to actually see that. You see reluctance. You see movement towards the United States, like the Aleutians campaign. Mm -hmm. um, that's a part of that. Um, it's connected. They want to be involved in the Pacific to what's going to happen there. I mean, the, the involvement in the Pacific is tiny in comparison to the other nations. Uh, but Hong Kong has an impact in that way. Uh, oh, but one of the biggest impacts I don't think about Hong Kong, sorry, this is a bit off of it, but uh, you don't see this much in Canada. You see it in the United States is revenge. Yeah. You see, you remember Pearl Harbor all over the United States. You don't see that in Canada, uh, but you do with Hong Kong. The units, because they still existed, right? The regiments still existed. They're talking about revenge the whole time. Like, we want to get in this fight to fight the Japanese. That's a tiny little part of it, but it, but it happens. Uh, Dieppe, yeah, there's a lot of mistrust. Um, mm. The blame game goes on forever. I mean, I think I posted a while back, there was a documentary that talked to all the big players, Montgomery, Creer, Everybody, Mountbatten, uh, before he's killed, because it's 62, I believe. Uh, I don't know, David O'Keefe sent it to me. It's easy to find. It's through the CBC. Uh, it's amazing, because there's just this blame game going on, and there's this huge distrust of what about it, like, going on. I think you have connections to the first Canadian Army with that, you know, having this Canadian control of Canadian troops and the bigger picture. I think that's part of it. Uh, but, yeah, there's a lot of mistrust. But uh, even with that, though, Brad, you'd, you'd still, if you were doing a book about that, if you were doing yeah. a book about, Anglo-Canadian relationships through yeah. World War II. Of course, you could pull out mentions by Churchill, Mackenzie King, Crera, all those guys there, and the yeah. press. You could find out editorials and comments by journalists. But how much of that would actually accurately gauge what the whole swathe of the populations of the two countries are thinking? You know, I mean, I I can yeah. tell you there are British politicians who have spoken for Britain 
in various eras of my life that I wholly do not agree with what that politician has been saying on yeah. my behalf as the leader of my country. So yeah. at certain points during the war and, and during today, your leader, my leader, France, they are making statements about the people yeah. of his country that some people do agree with and others don't. And again, it's changing. It's changing day to day and how if you're on a remote farm in Canada or you're in Toronto or Ottawa, your understanding of current affairs, the speed of which you're getting information, okay, you've got radios, newspapers, yeah. it's going to be different. It's going to be very, it's, it's complicated, isn't it? So you could do a book about what was being said by officials, but yeah. how much would that really reflect what the average yeah, I mean, is saying? That's a great way to put it. I think it's hard, like, you can never speak for a whole group ever, right? But I think the overall trend in Canada is very interesting. And this is why I think Canada's uh, Second World War is so important to understand for today, because I would argue it towards the beginning of the war, a lot of people, yeah, we're Canadian, but we're also British in that sense. Mm. We don't have our own passports until after the war. Like, it doesn't come until 1947. I think that's a huge indicative thing of all of this, right? It's not even thought about that we need a separate passport. Like, Mackenzie King's the first one. Like, it's it's so symbolic. I mean, and I've seen in the sidebar here uh, the DF-44 story, which to me is huge because I've looked at Criar quite extensively, and I think he's a good case study for this. I mean, he's called all kinds of nasty things for Hong Kong, DF, all of that. I don't think any most of it's true. He's... Uh, yeah, like there's no citizenship. It's now no Canadian citizens. They're British subjects until 1947. Mm. Uh, so like that's to me is indicative, right? We could have done that much earlier, just like I was saying, uh, but we didn't. Uh, but I think, sorry, going back to Criar, right? He's told by Monty, you have to be at this meeting. You have to be here. And he fights on it, like, let's move it, blah, blah, blah. The letter, letter gets it too late. Criar is at the meeting, uh, sorry, at the ceremony in Dieppe. I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, he did the right call. I think because it shows his personal... I don't want to use the word growth, but development through the war. Early on, he's more seeing himself as in line with Britain. I wouldn't call him a sycophant like some others have, because uh, that's not fair with what he's trying to do. But I think towards the end of the war, he's thinking more about Canada first uh, and more of what he can do for Canada, not necessarily what he can do for all of the allies. Like, I mean, he's a master politician soldier. Like, I don't think anybody else could handle it the way he did. Uh, but I think that's just an, it's an you know it's an example of the development right by forty by September forty four he's thinking about these things in different ways. Well, and, I think that that's universe, isn't it? You see that yeah. with with Churchill, with I'm sure in Indian majors in the Indian Army, but it's, by forty four everyone's thinking, hang on, we've kind of nearly got this match finished now. Yeah. What's the next game going to be? Who are we playing next? What's what's yeah. our next phase? You definitely see that. I mean, as Alan Allport talked about the Battle of Britain, the the way the Battle of Britain was being reported and talked yeah. about changes and evolves. And, and yeah, like you, the show you, you did, see, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you see those changes of everybody starting to to think not self selfishly is not the right word, but think more more within their own community, their own country yeah. first. Uh, because you've kind of had four years of putting the global cause five years first. It's time now to think, hang on, where are we going to end up at the end of this? Where, Where is our... Um, for example, one thing that France managed to do so incredibly well is end up with themselves having a huge negotiating position in 1945, yeah. you know. And I'm not saying they don't deserve it or they do deserve it, but there's lots of participant nations that, that were thinking, hang on, France gets to be there? with France, America, Russia... And, Canada has a big claim to be part of that. And it's just interesting that everyone starts thinking, okay, yeah, let's think about myself and my and my 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 career and my country's yeah. career. I think it's in going back to the way you phrased it, right? About the the, the obviously the typical Canadian, right? I think it's the only because we only a lot of those people have passed on, right? Like my grandparents are from that generation and passed over 10 years ago. It's it's we have things like the material culture and monuments, right? We have hardly any monuments to the second world war. We mm. tack them onto the first world war. And I think that's indicative of the way people viewed the war and themselves afterwards. It's like, all right, we're done with this. That's two wars in almost a generation. I want to work and have a family and play hockey. Basically. <laughs> like yeah. we literally, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like earlier, we literally build like all across the country. There's arenas literally called Memorial arena. It's for the war. It's a war Memorial. It's a, you know, practical memorial. And like the First World War memorials are very imperialistic in a lot of ways with imagery and all that stuff. Second World War, they don't exist in that sense. 
uh, so I think that's a it's a really indicative thing. And again, that's just my observations. But I I look for these memorials no matter where I am. So I'm kind of starting to build up some thinking about this. But I think that's really indicative of of the way Canadians viewed themselves as the war progressed. I think I do think there was a lot of change. Uh, probably in '39, if you ask them, September 1st, 1939. You know, this is Britain's fight because we're part of this too. Uh, maybe by '45, it's a lot of people have probably changed their minds. And this is, in a much greater sense, you know, we, 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 we talk about World War II as being 39 to 45, but actually it's it kind of born out of depression. It's born out of the, you know, Hitler's in charge from 33 onwards. You've got the Indian. It, it, you're talking about, let's say, let's talk about 10 years. You get ten, people, are going, people are going into the, the World War II phase in their teens, coming out of their late 20s. They're going in their 40s, coming out in their 60s. People's feelings and opinions evolve over time. You know, I've I've just got older while I've been living here, and therefore my opinions about things yeah. have just changed. And so it's we, we've we're getting quite deep now, but it's we've talked about <laughs> it on shows before. This idea of speaking for the veterans, I I hurl, I metaphorically hurl things at the television or the computer the computer screen when someone says yeah. the veterans would have wanted this or the veterans wouldn't have wanted that. It's going you're speaking as if they are robots who who yeah. yes we're all individuals. I'm not. That's life of Brian <laughs> quote there. Yeah. You can't yeah. speak for them like that, and you can't yeah. speak for them. Over the course of their lives, you know, I know people who were staunch Tory voters when they were younger, became Labour voters when they're older, or vice versa. It's yep. it's we're all evolving, constantly changing. My, you know, when I get the simple questions, what's your favourite war film? What's your favourite album of all time? It changes depending on what I've just listened to. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's not constant. It's not fixed. Um, yeah. It's, someone said earlier, and I didn't do but peg that question, but someone said, which figure from Canadian military history in the Second World War should be better known? And my <laughs> response to that would be, depends who I've just been reading about. you know. <laughs> and and uh, you catch yeah. me in one particular week, I'd give you one answer, because this guy was amazing. And two weeks late, later, I've not forgotten his story, but I'm now reading about some other insanely brilliant person who's now in the front of my brain. So it's yeah. yeah, same here. I mean, that's a, not an easy one to answer. I mean, there's so many that I, but uh, same thing, right? Because I do the same thing kind of that you do, right? I'm reading a different book than I was last week. So I'm like, yeah, these stories are amazing. Uh, and then I forget, not forget, like you said, but I'm focused, I guess, on you, this you, Your attention turns to something new, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah like so I was doing Bomber Command last week. This week I'm doing Very Rich. So it's, I'm kind of all over the place. But again, I, I'm going to skirt that like I was trying to skirt that other question and just say Canadian military history needs to be better known in Canada and around the world, particularly in the other allied nations. Um, I'm just going to come out right and say that. Yes, of course, that benefits me with my work, but I do truly believe that. Um, and, and that's probably that kind of question can help with that. Is I think, yeah, and I think what we, I think that <laughs> if, we, if we end up this show, because we've been at it two hours nearly now, is that, is that I want to, for me, the, the, the best policy to bring history, World War II history and history generally to people is to adopt the Eisenhower broad front strategy <laughs> and think yeah. about books, podcasts, YouTube, documentaries, mm -hmm. films, graphic novels, mainstream education, role models, um, you know, reenactment. Uh, all of those things are going to be part of the way of bringing people forward. And, and I think if there's one thing I've learned in the last year and a half of doing this and I've been in COVID and lots of time to reflect on mm -hmm. what am I enjoying about being a tour guide, what don't I like about being a tour guide, is that we, we've got to move with the times and 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 yep. not be dismissive of the different mediums through which people are getting access. The video game element is interesting. And, I, you know, I, I had... Quite, you know, I did a couple of shows, as you know, about video games and comics and things. And I had a number of historians. I'm not going to watch those those shows. I don't. I'm not, and you think, well, you kind of should because that there's right. an incredible reach video gamers have um, well, as movies uh, have. Sorry, I didn't want to cut you off, but that's kind of my own personal. I agree, completely agree with you. Uh, the broad front, a great metaphor, <laughs> great analogy, but it, it's true. I mean, one of the things because I had a lot of time to think too with doing the PhD at the end of COVID and having breaks that are, you know, part of the PhD process and thinking about this. And, and one day it kind of just hit me, like I can write an article that 10 people are going to read, or I can put a video up that hundreds potentially could see. So 
what do I want to do with what I'm doing? Do I want yeah. to do the same old yeah, thing? Yeah. Do I want to change how this could be done? And I and I, I agree with you. We can't say one's stupid or it's not correct or whatever. You have to kind of go with what people want. And I mean, we have people watching right now. YouTube is clearly has an impact and it can't be you know dismissed. And, it's, and it's, it's evenings like this, no an afternoon for you. No offense to you, to you, Brad. Is I'm one I'm wondering kind of would I sit and watch me ramble on for two, <laughs> two hours? I wouldn't, but people are here, and they're not just here. They're here for every show. So, okay, it's not millions of an audience, but there are people out there who clearly are starred for something. They don't feel that mainstream television is providing the documentary content that it was of years ago. And, yep. yes, we can find a fault. Yeah, Valor and the Horror, I don't know what its viewing figures would have been back in 92, but I would imagine – very high they were, and yeah. what we're doing on youtube now is not reaching those market that those figures right. there but it's reaching some people and it's reaching enough and and that's i'm absolutely adamant about moving it forward as i know for those of you following me on twitter it, we, we all got into a bit of kind of um it got a bit argumentative on twitter over the weekend about inclusivity and i got some lots of that's angry dms from people saying you know you you shouldn't be trying. You shouldn't be banging on about it all the time. And I, well, I'm sorry. I'm, I am going to be banging on about it all the yeah. time. And it's not about because it's right. Although it is right, it everything is right. society should be inclus inclusive. It's it, it's a natural for me. Natural that it's bisexual day. I think bisexuals in society day or something. I happened to read that earlier. Everybody, regardless of their gender, color, race, color, political background, age, access, should be interested in history, but also. It's to give us a wider variety of voices. I, I I hope that the people that, if I'm inspiring anybody, and if you're inspiring anybody, that when we look at their bookshelves in 20 years' time, they won't just be full of tweed-wearing middle-aged uh, middle -aged <laughs> white guys. Um, <laughs> as much as I love the books by the tweed-wearing middle-aged white guys, Peter Caddick Adams, Robert Lyman, I'm looking in your direction. <laughs> you know, they're brilliant historians, but their voices are coming from one demographic and you know david patterson who we know and great dominion and a lot of us watching we are gonna be a lot of us white blokes you know right. yeah and <laughs> more i would i would venture that world war ii was fought more by by more non-white people was, was effect was was it world war ii influenced far more non-white people than it did white people it's a simple, simple geography yeah, of math. It sounds crazy, and yet, yeah, true. Yeah. And yet, we, we're only looking at it from these narrow angles, and we absolutely need to start getting in more Indian voices and African voices, and and all and and female voices and female African, female African lesbian trans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever. It's the point is is that we need to be moving forward. And the more pushback, I don't get much pushback, but you know how it is, Brad, that, that one snarky comment that you one got person. Yeah. keeps you awake at night. The 99 people who say what you're doing is great, that's brilliant, but it's that one, like, I will go to bed tonight thinking about how I offended Mark Loop, whoever Mark is, about, <laughs> you know, that will, that will register in my brain yep. more than the praise. Because yeah, it, you feel that you've let someone down. You feel that I, I will feel I've disappointed someone, that he he's a potential person who could maybe become a subscriber, become a supporter. And for whatever reason, he has become alienated by what we're doing. And that, to me, is a is a defeat. I, I, I've i lost him. Um, yeah. yeah, and I just – I completely agree with everything you said. Like, I jumped to your support when that one – you had a couple of ones that were like, why you didn't do this or why are you doing that? And I'm just like – stop this is not helpful but anyway i completely agree with you on those fronts also to me yes it's the right thing to do because it's the right thing to do i was literally thinking about this this morning because i have taken the same sort of mindset with mine i'm trying to broaden topics and individuals and who comes on and that kind of thing um again i, I mine's not just world war ii right i'm trying to do canada all mm. of it and mm. i'm trying to broaden who what that means right but anyway sorry uh why i think it's important also is because of the stories the stories are what interests me uh, if we don't have all these people involved, we're losing stories. And I don't want yeah. that to happen. We've lost enough. So why are we going to do this on purpose now? Like, to me, that's just, that's crazy. Like how you can say you love this stuff and then say, oh, we don't need those stories. To me, that's just, that's it, it, it is, it is patently ridiculous. And, you know, the analogy I was using to Mag a couple of days ago is that if I was wanting to gauge what it's like living in Bayer, where I live, I could go and ask the 10 millionaires who own 20 properties each in the kind of old quarter, 
but I'd be better to go and answer people who are living in rented council accommodation, people who are in retirement homes, young mm -hmm. people, people from outside of Bayer, people who are from different backgrounds and get a swathe of a hundred versions. And that would give me a far better idea of what life is like living in Bayer. And people would point out things that I would never have conceived conceived of because I'm living in a certain, you know, that, and, I, and people will get angry. If I even say the word white male privilege, people are getting angry with me, right? People who aren't even watching this have just suddenly pricked up. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> here we go again. With this. <laughs> it's bloody true. We, we don't, Alan Allport is always talking about, we don't notice it because we don't know what it's like not to have what we have. And so it's in key to me that we get more voices in because, as you say, the stories will be brilliant. And our understanding of the events will be wider and therefore better. It's win, win, win for everybody. Yeah, that's. Yeah, I don't think I can <laughs> say that any better. That's probably a good it's, place to end. But yeah, but the, the the pushback you get, we uh, we you know is 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 there, and you know it's. I'm it's, expecting it's, it to be honest. Like I'm expecting some more to come, like because I'm pretty small, right? But uh, is, is get more. Like I've had some weird comments and some nasty ones, and on Twitter as well, and all that stuff. Yeah, like you said, that's the one that gets you. That's kind of like a, you know, direct to the heart kind of thing. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm expecting blowback, but honestly, in a, in a way, I don't care because I, I think that this is important. Um, yeah. And I'm not, it's just important to me. It's important to what I think and how things should go. But it's also, again, I'm not saying what I did is better, but I'm just an academically trained historian. Mm, I mm. think collecting stories and, and doing this in different ways is hugely important. I'm not yeah. thinking about it in one button down kind of way anymore. I used to probably, but now I'm like, that doesn't make any sense because we lose stuff and I don't want to lose anymore. We've lost so many, like, cause I, I mean, stories from my own family, right? Sorry. Keep bringing this deck to me, but family stories are gone because the people are gone. I don't want that anymore. I want as many stories we can get from whoever we can. And, and to me, that's just so important. There's, I mean, there's Nicholas Patton is saying some channels suggest to write the word question in caps before a specific question. There's, there's all sorts of tips about how to engage and how to move things forward. Yeah. And I think sometimes in my case, and I, I don't want to kind of be all, get my little violin for sympathy out, is <laughs> I think sometimes people think that I have a team of people, as they probably think yeah. you have a team. It's yeah, literally do. just me. Mag does some of my yeah. promotion on Instagram. Is Mag is there. Mag cooks for me and does stuff when I'm, you know, and it's great. But... I do everything. I literally do everything. I do the emails and the research, make the graphics, do the listings, type up the descriptions, put the links into the books, the links into this, the links into that. I do the research. I start, I respond to the comments. I do everything, everything. And and it's not like, you know, you're writing a letter to the BBC saying you didn't do this or CBC, you didn't, where it's a corporation. But it's literally yeah. just me and it can be quite wounding sometimes. Yeah. People, you didn't mention this. You go, no, I didn't mention that. We had an hour and a half and of course there are, yeah. Because you know, as you are, you're 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 walking a path that is festooned with rabbit holes. <laughs> you're thinking, yeah. if I go down that oh, yeah. one, I'm never going to get out of that one. Nope. And you're kind of warily moving with, oh, he's a he's a character that I could go off on a whole tangent about. Yep. And you know, but it's about debate and and creating a dialogue, isn't it? And and yep. anyway, brilliant. Well, yeah. I think there's no more questions coming. People just said, we're, we're, it's a, it, as Susan, I think, said there, we need to leave a better world where people accept each other. It's pretty simple, isn't it? That's and um, it. Yep. and Paul Reed said, you're both indies in a stream that is full of people with massive media machines behind them. Ain't that right? Um, yeah. Um, but it doesn't it doesn't dissuade me from continuing. And, mm -hmm. and everything is climbing, and everything in your case is climbing. It's just sometimes the climbs aren't quite as dramatic as you'd like, and you look yeah. at it's the the danger of me is looking at these other channels. Oh, he's had fifteen million videos. So right people on. can just go on and go boom, 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 for an hour, and they get fifteen million views. And what, right what, what's whatever? Anyway, it's interesting. Yeah. So, um, Brad. Well, again, I'll just remind people the link to your YouTube channel and your Twitter account is in the description below. And you know, it, it's it's funny. I I may be slightly ahead of the game than you now, and you're ahead of someone else, but in the years time, you'll be a further up the game and there'll be someone else who'll be looking to you for examples. And, and what I think is good is that those of us, you know, Alex and Alina and the other, and the Matt and, and involved in history hack and yourself and JD and history underground, we are in communication with each other and we're trying to cross pollinate and help each other out a bit. And, and that's, we have to, because the, the big, the really big hitters won't be, won't be particularly interested in helping us out. Um, yep. We've got to keep keep it going. And what you're doing is complementary to what I'm doing. And 
and and history hack and what matt bone does with his wonderful hedge hopping segment on history hack is incredible about aviation world war ii we all need to help each other out so there we are so brad you've, you've talked well just plug what you've got so you've got an interview with david o'keefe coming up tomorrow yeah so i've got david o'keefe tomorrow at 4 30 eastern but again just like with world war ii tv you can watch it after um and we've comments below that helps us as well um i will say that and liking things like like this video for Paul, please do that. It helps him. And leaving comments after as well is very helpful. Yep, like, subscribe, comment, share, and and don't just think that it, it doesn't help because it does help. Um, yeah. And you know, keep the even if you walk out, keep the feed running because it helps. The, the longer you keep it going, it helps us out because the, yep. the show retention level is important and the sharing. Do it for all the time. Yep. <laughs> there's, a, there's a magic. There's a certain amount of magic behind how YouTube works, and I kind of spend time analyzing it. And there's that. It's it's like when you ask an uh, a pilot how helicopters work, they can explain it to ninety nine point nine percent. The last <laughs> bit is it's just magic. They, yeah, they just it just something. works, and we we accept yeah. the fact it works, and it, and it's. With the with the with the YouTube algorithm, and it's Rich there because Rich with his Vickers machine again, another another one out there plowing the way forward as his historic firearms, Matthew Moss, as he's fighting on film, plowing the way, trying to understand how you. <coughs> I'll tell you this: I will understand the dynamics of World War Two sooner than I will understand the dynamics of YouTube. I, you know, that, that's <laughs> yeah, isn't that the truth? Yeah, that's that's definitely <laughs> it is what it is. Yeah, that's a good point. But oh, uh, I yeah. missed the question about Ipswich. Did I miss a question about Ipswich? My team, yeah, I, did, I did miss a great about you. Yeah, we're not doing very well. Hopefully, we're gonna win on Saturday. Um, but yeah, Ipswich 20th in the in, in division one, which is the third league in England, and that's not going very well, but we'll get better anyway. Good. So, um, well, thanks everybody for watching. Thanks, Brad, for joining us. And again, I'll say it again if you're not following on this day in Canadian military history, you should be. And don't just think it's because it's Can it's Canadian, it's no interest to you because it's not just Canadian, it's Canadian folks, but it all connects, it all has this symbiotic um understanding of world war ii and the fact is you're doing it and and your the time you put in it and you invest in it it deserves attention you are you're you're, you're building like all of us are building and it's because of your hard work and it's important so there we are so have you enjoyed the chat brad oh yeah i loved it this was great getting to chat about different stuff and you know your experiences too it's it's good to know that i'm not alone which is always nice to hear yeah, well, it's, it's feeling part that, you know, how people have got your back sometimes. That's the good thing is, is that when I do get the insulting message or something, I, people do kind of leap in and come to my defense, usually, which is quite good. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and in my case, I fall back on the fact that it's my historian's views, my guests, whereas, you know, you are more of a, so, you know, you have your guests as well, but it's a yeah. lot more because you're the academically trained historians, you know, and it's, the, uh, the show I did about Arnhem with R.G. Poulison there, you know, a lot of people disagree with what he said. A lot of people did agree with what he said. But it's yeah. the point is I'll have someone else coming on about Arnhem. Other, well, did it will be on tomorrow. He'll give a different view. There's no there's no definitive vis version or vision or explanation for these events. There's only opinion, and we all have different ones. So there we are. Well, anybody. Anyway, thank you, everybody, for watching. Uh, this is Paul and Brad for World War II TV and On This Day in Game and Military History saying thank you very much for your time. I will see you all again. So tomorrow night for me, 7 p.m. UK time, Dilip Sarkar ending off Arnhem Week with the human tragedy, tragedy element of it. So the stories of some of the fallen. So there we are. I will see you all again. Cheers, everybody.